Okay, I assume the microphone is on now. Yeah, it's showing up. Okay, this will take a while and probably take multiple videos, but this will be a free public domain audiobook of Flatland, An Adventure in Many Dimensions, a 2024 translation into casual English. If you are unfamiliar with the original Flatland, an a romance of many dimensions, that was written and published in 1884, and it is extremely hilarious, but it is from 1884, so the way that language is used, and the words used, and even just the basic structure of the sentences can make it hard for a lot of people to, un to understand. So, since September 2023, I decided I was going to translate it into casual English. I'm pretty sure modern English is like a specific thing referring to a specific era, so I don't even know if I can call it that. But I'm just saying casual English. So I will be, you can read this for free on, you can get it from Itch.io, you can read it on Tumblr, you can read it on Pillowfort, I would put it on Facebook, but I'm way too lazy for that. You can read it on the Internet Archive. And this will go on YouTube and the Internet Archive, and this will be a video so that you can follow along as I read it out loud. Uh, if you can see the screen here, this is the original art that I made for the cover showing, well, a scene that will be later in the book, so you can see that. And I'm just going to scroll down. I don't have a mouse with a wheel scroll, so I will just have to use the arrow keys here. Flatland, an adventure in many dimensions, a 2024 translation into casual English, Originally, original story by Edwin Abbott Abbott, translated into casual English by Tinio. And also, I'm doing all of this in one take. I am not going to be editing out mistakes, because I'm doing that for the Tarzan audiobooks I'm making, and it, it takes forever. About this translation. This story is public domain. This means you can read it for free, anywhere online, without having to pay for it, unless you've chosen to buy it from me as a thank as a thank you for making it. This also means that you can take this story and do anything you want with it. You can make it into a movie, an audiobook, you can edit it to change all the characters' names and pronouns, or turn them into unicorns. You can translate it into different languages, and you can sell anything you make from it, or even just print it yourself and sell it that way. Why have I chosen to do this after spending so much time and work making this, you ask? Because I'm poor, and I want other poor people to also be able to read books for free, and because I think the world is more fun when people are allowed to be creative without copyright law getting in the way. You will be able to buy physical copies of this book from me if you want on lulu.com, as long as lulu.com exists. And if you would like to send me money after reading the book for free, as long as PayPal exists and I'm still alive, you can send it to Tinio Flatland on PayPal. And do me the favor of ignoring my dead name. I'm too poor to get a legal name change at the moment. If you would like to read the original version of this story, published in 1884, you can look up Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, online, and read it for free, because that's also public domain, which is how I was able to make this for you to read. Isn't it great? If you are reading this online, congrats! If you're reading it in a physical book and you didn't know you could also read it for free online, then congrats! You can. It can be found on archive.org, otherwise otherwise known as the Internet Archive, unless you're reading this in two, in, I don't even know how you would say that, in 2300 or something, and they don't exist anymore, along with other places too. Just, for, just search for the title, and it should show up. This translation was started on September 15th, 2023, at 7.55 p.m. It was raining today. I'm writing this so that in the future, when the original story of Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, published in 1884, has become so antiquated that it's hard for students and other readers to understand the language, there will at least be one more recent stepping stone to aid in understanding. I'm also writing this so that schools who want to teach Flatland may do so with a bit more ease since it might be hard to get kids to read the old one. I will try to keep my translation as accurate to the original Flatland as I can, while making it easier to understand. 
Sometimes I may interject if I think extra information will be helpful, with my comments marked by double parentheses and a note that I'm the one interrupting. Double quotation marks. Note from the second editor, slash, end note from the second editor. Flatland, a romance of many adventures... <laughs> okay, that's a typo. I'll fix that later. Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, was written as satire to criticize the systems of oppression that the author saw around him in Victorian London. Satire is a form of humor where the flaws of something are emphasized to make them more obvious and clear. Many people today, and back then, struggle to understand the satire that Edwin Abbott Abbott had crafted. So I'm making this note in the hopes that more people will understand it properly and look at this book from the right, well, angle. Haha. <laughs> The narrator of this story calls himself a square to protect his identity, similar to the way people whose identity is not known will be called things like J. Doe or M. Smith. His name is not actually a square, but many people enjoy calling him Abbott Square after the author. A square represents bigots of all kind who are so wrapped up in their own biased worldview that they implicitly trust everything they are told by the people in power without ever taking the time to actually question anything enough to realize that what they've been told and how the world actually works do not match up at all. This idea applies both to his ideas of the dimensions and the systems of social hierarchy and oppression. You will see many contradictions in A Square's testimony of how the world works that he doesn't realize contra are contradictions at all. Because to him, actual logic and facts don't really matter, he just goes along with whatever those higher up tell him. You will see him thoughtlessly repeat propaganda that conflicts with everything else he has been told to believe without a single trace of irony or awareness of these conflicts. You are meant to be shocked and horrified and flabbergasted by A Square's ideas about society. That's the whole point. The point is that he's wrong. To get you to examine your thoughts about society, to see if you are falling prey, if you are falling into any of the same pitfalls he is. The whole point is to show how absolutely ridiculous his ideas are. You're supposed to laugh at him. It's a comedy. And the joke is how ridiculous and absurd bigots are all the time without them even realizing it. There's a lot more I could say about this subject, but I'll stop here and let you get onto the story. For this version of the book, which includes illustrations, I will also be including image descriptions for all of the illustrations so generously provided by the original author, along with any additional illustrations I created myself for all my fellow irregulars out there reading this. The original Flatland is around 33,000 words long. This version came out to around 39,000. This translation was... For this version of the document, completed on July 25th, 2024. This version is meant to be read digitally. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. If you are reading this 100 years in the future, I hope the world is a better place than it is today. I hope global warming has been managed. I hope capitalism has ended. I hope that irregulars of all kinds... Queer people, black and brown people, disabled people, religious minorities are treated as equals and that no one has to go without food or shelter. I hope the word homeless seems antiquated and confusing because everyone has a home. I hope sea turtles aren't still eating plastic because of nonstop pollution and corruption. I hope the black-footed ferrets and bison recover from endangerment and are thriving in their natural environments again. I hope that white supremacy and colonization has been overthrown, and that the world looks back on the country that called itself the United States of America with all due horror, disgust, and shame. I hope that slavery has been ab abolished permanently, everywhere, with no loophole saying, except as punishment for a crime. I hope that slaves are not sent to fight wildfires or build bombs to send overseas to murder Palestinians or any other victims of colonization. I hope that the world has figured out a way to disarm all nuclear bombs and has agreed to forever forget the knowledge of how to make more. <clears throat> I hope that physical books still exist and that libraries still exist and that corporate monopolies have all long since been destroyed. I hope everyone everywhere has access to free, quality health care and that all of the stolen land in this world is given back to its rightful stewards. If you are reading this in the future, I hope you live in a better world than what we have right now. And if you are reading this right now, 
I hope you take every opportunity presented to you to learn more, to question more, and to make this world a better place. Enjoy. Signed, Tin Yell. Pronounced Tin Yell. A physically disabled and autistic and ADHD non-binary arrow ace lesbian who uses it, its, itself, and skull, skull, skull self pronouns. I mention this because I know bigots in 2050 plus will still probably try to pretend that queer identities are brand new and only invented last year, and so that queer and questioning people in 2024 can see that other, others are out there. P.S. My cat says hi. This is the end of the preface by the second editor. To the inhabitants of space in general, and HC in particular, this work is dedicated by a humble native of Flatland in the hope that, even as he was initiated into the mysteries of three dimensions, having been previously conversant with only two, so that citizens of that celestial region may aspire yet higher and higher to the secrets of four, five, or even six dimensions, thereby contributing to the enlargement of the imagination and the possible development of that most rare and excellent gift of modesty among the superior races of solid humanity. Preface to the Second and Revised Edition, 1884, by the original editor. I am writing this preface for my friend from Flatland, since he has been so mentally devastated by his years spent in prison that he can't write it himself. Rather than copying his words directly, I am paraphrasing on his behalf so that you, my readers, will understand what he means. Let me get a drink, so pause. First of all, he wants to thank all of his readers, both fans and critics, in Spaceland, who've enjoyed this, who have enjoyed his book so much that he had to get it reprinted again to meet the demand. Second of all, he also wants to apologize for some errors and misprints in the original edition, though these weren't actually his fault. Third of all, he wants to explain a few things that have confused some readers. He wanted to respond himself, but he's not the square he used to be. The problem is not just that he's a prisoner, it's that no one believes what he has to say and do nothing but mock him, and he struggles to tell reality from dream. He is also an old man now, and his memory is fading. He's forgotten many of the ideas he learned on his adventures in Spaceland, and the words to describe them. So he has asked me to reply on his behalf to explain two points that many confused readers are upset or annoyed by. The first thing people complain about is that when a flatlander sees a line, that means he has to be seeing something that does have height, not just length, width and length, otherwise it would be invisible from the side. So why doesn't he admit that his people already exist in three dimensions? I understand that people are going to complain about this since it's such an obvious problem, especially to Spacelanders. I must say I really wasn't sure how to respond when I first read this comment because I couldn't think of any counter-argument, but fortunately my friend was able to answer it in a way that makes sense to me, so I'll paraphrase his words here for you. I admit that I admit that what this critic said about us having some height is true, but that doesn't mean we exist in three dimensions the way Spacelanders do. Yes, flatlanders are tall as well as long and wide, otherwise we would be invisible, but this isn't something we can measure or recognize on our own. Remember, I didn't even know the word up before in my adventure in Spaceland. And you Spacelanders also have a fourth dimension that you don't have a name for, that I'll call extra height, that you can't measure or understand on your own either, but this doesn't mean that you're fourth dimensional beings any more than I'm a third dimensional being. Even after my adventure, I still can't measure height or upwards, not by seeing it or even trying to imagine it. But I know it's there, and I have to rely on pure faith. Let me try to explain. You can only measure something if it has variation to be measured in the first place. If everyone, and every single thing you see, animals, animals, people, trees, buildings, rocks, even is exactly the same height, then you can't measure height because there's nothing to compare it to. It's just the way the world is. Nothing is shorter than anything else or taller. There's nothing there to measure. 
especially because everything you see is all that you can everything that you see is all that you can see you can't see above the height of everything or below it it's just what's there some Spacelander critics who like to complain too much have suggested we invent a so-called delicate micrometer to measure our height to measure our height with but again that's impossible for us to do because we can't measure upwards nor can we compare it to anything else when we see a line from the side, we see something that is long and bright, and that's how we know it's a line. Brightness and length are both needed for us to understand what we are seeing. If there is no brightness, the line becomes invisible to us and may as well not exist. This is why, when I try to explain the concept of height or upwards to my fellow Flatlanders, when I try to point out that the existence of height in a when I try to point out the existence of height in a line, the only thing they can see is the brightness. And when I tell them I mean something else, a different dimension, they demand I prove it's there by measuring it, which I obviously can't do for the reasons I've already explained. You can't measure what has no variation. It was just yesterday that the chief circle, our high priest, or maybe in your terms better understood as the president or king, came to visit me, the seventh of his yearly visits, and just like the last six times he came to visit me, he asked me the same question. Are you sane yet? And so I tried to explain to him that he was tall as well as wide and long, and you can probably guess his response. You say I am high, so measure my highness, and then I'll believe you. And how exactly am I supposed to do the impossible? I've already explained that we can't measure height. There was nothing I could do to prove what I said, and we both knew it. So he left the room just as triumphant as the, six, as the earlier six visits. Still confused? Then put yourself in my shoes. Imagine a person from the fourth dimension decided to visit you and said, when you, Whenever you open your eyes, you see what appears to be a two-dimensional image, and you understand that these are actually many different three-dimensional objects through shading and light, and because you can reach out and touch them. And you think everything you are seeing is three-dimensional, but, really, you're also seeing a fourth dimension, and it's not color or shadows or anything like that, but a true, separate dimension. No, I can't point it out to you. No, I can't give you any way of measuring it or seeing it. You're just gonna have to trust me. And how would you respond to someone saying this? Wouldn't you want him thrown into an asylum, too? Well, that's what happened to me. I was a square who tried to convince my countrymen that there was a third dimension, Wow, that's a typo. And I was locked up, just as you Spacelanders would lock up anyone who tried to tell you there was a fourth dimension. Alas, the family resemblance of ignorance and bigotry runs strong through humanity in all dimensions. Points, lines, squares, cubes, extra cubes, it doesn't matter. We are all just as likely to make the same mistakes, believing only what we can see, and refusing to think beyond that. As your famous Spaceland playwright William Shakespeare once said, one touch of nature makes all worlds akin. That was the author's <clears throat> That was the author's answer in reply to the first complaint, and it makes sense to me. As a further note on this point, the author also wants me to tell you that in his updated version of his story, we have added back in some of the extra details of his conversations with the sphere that we originally left out because we assumed you, the audience, would find them boring and unnecessary. So there is his defense against the first point of complaint. I can't find anything to argue with about it. It seems like a solid defense. As for the second point of complaint, I wish I could tell you that his response to the criticism was just as well thought out, but I can't. It has been objected that he is a woman hater and, because many of the people making this complaint are women themselves, who feel hurt by this, I want to reassure you to the best of my ability that this is not the case, at least as far as I can tell you without lying. The unfortunate fact is that the square who is the author of this book is not used to thinking in terms of morality, let alone the ideas of morality that we have in Spaceland, that we in Spaceland have. If I were to literally transcribe his response to this complaint, I'd be making him look much worse than he really is, because he doesn't really understand how to articulate his thoughts on this topic, because Flatland, or at least his country in Flatland, does not have the words to describe it. Note from the second editor. I want to emphasize that when the original editor here says that the author doesn't have words for morality, he means that very literally, as you'll see later when the author is narrating for himself. End of editor's note. 
So, as I am already doing by paraphrasing his words for you, I will paraphrase ag again his response to this allegation of misogyny. It's my understanding that in the seven years since he was imprisoned, he has changed many of the personal views he expressed in this book, both in regards to women as well as the isosceles and other lower classes, such as irregulars. His opinion is now much closer to that of the sphere who visited him, that straight lines are in many ways superior to circles. But because he wrote this book from the perspective of a historian, he aligned himself, maybe too closely, with the general views held by the higher classes of Flatland and, as I've since told him, many among us here in Spaceland. I don't think I need to tell you that many of our own historians, who are mostly men, have generally thought that the lives of women and other oppressed people were not worthy of caring or writing about. The author, the author also wishes to deny the idea that he is still a supporter of the circles and aristocracy. 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 He has had a long time to think since his imprisonment, and while he doesn't deny that the circles are very intelligent, otherwise, he says, they wouldn't have managed to stay in control for so long, he believes that the facts of Flatland speak for themselves. Revolution cannot always be suppressed by slaughter, and because the circles themselves tend to be infertile, he believes that nature herself has condemned their actions as a failure in the end. And this is where, he said, I see the laws of nature working in all worlds. Man thinks he is doing one thing, and he thinks he knows best, but nature is wise and cannot be denied. Her end goal is much different and better. Whoops. I zoomed in by... Clicked the wrong button, zoomed in too much. Uh, her end goal is much different and better than what man plans for. For the other complaints, the author begs the readers not to assume that every detail of daily life in Flatland is a mirror of some other detail in Spaceland. He hopes that his book, taken as a whole, will be educational as well as amusing to Spacelanders who are willing to suspend their disbelief and not immediately cry, That can't happen! or No, things only work like this! The rest of this book I leave to him in his original words, now with a small addition of some clarification in his conversations with the Sphere. Note from the second editor, if you would like to read the author's original words as transcribed by the original editor, please look for Flatland, a romance of many dimensions online. It is public domain and belongs to everyone, so you can read it or listen to it as an audiobook completely for free. Flatland, an adventure in many dimensions, by A Square. Table of Contents, Part 1, This World. Uh, yeah, I guess I will read the Table of Contents. Section 1, of the nature of Flatland. Section 2, of the climate and houses in Flatland. Section 3, concerning the inhabitants of Flatland. Section 4, concerning the women. Section 5, of our methods of recognizing one another. Section 6, of recognition by sight. Section 7, Concerning Irregular Figures. Section 8, Of the Ancient Practice of Painting. Section 9, Of the Universal Color Bill. Section 10, Of the Suppression of the Chromatic Sedition. Section 11, Concerning Our Priests. Section 12, Of the Doctrine of Our Priests. Part 2, Other Worlds. Section 13, How I Had a Vision of Lineland. Section 14, How I Vainly Tried to Explain the Nature of Flatland. Section 15, Concerning a Stranger from Spaceland. Section 17, How the Stranger Vainly Endeavored to Reveal to Me in Words the Mysteries of Spaceland. Section 17, How the Sphere, Having in Vain Tried Words, Resorted to Deeds. Section 18, How I Came to Spaceland and What I Saw There. Section 19, How, Though the Sphere Showed Me Other Mysteries of Spaceland, I Still Desired More and What Came of It. Section 20, how the Sphere Encouraged Me in a Vision. Section 21. How I Tried to Teach the Theory of Three Dimensions to My Grandson, and with What Success. Section 22. How I Then Tried to Diffuse the Theory of Three Dimensions by Other Means, and of the Result. Part 1. This World. Be patient, for the world is broad and wide. Section 1 of The Nature of Flatland 
I don't call our world Flatland because that's what we call it, but because I want to make what it's like clearer to you, my happy readers who are privileged to live in space. Imagine a vast sheet of paper on which straight lines, triangles, squares, pentagons, hexagons, and other geometric shapes are alive and move freely instead of being drawn in pencil. They move on... Oh, another typo. They move on, or maybe you'd call it within, the surface of the paper, but do not and cannot rise above or sink below it. Almost like shadows, but hard and solid, with glowing edges. If you can imagine this, you'll have a pretty good idea of what my country looks like. Just a few years ago, I would have said my universe instead of my country, but now I know better. In such a flat land, you Spacelanders will almost immediately assume that it's impossible for there to be anything you would consider solid. And yet, if you look down, you'll see the triangles, squares, and other figures, just like I said. We, on the other hand, see no such thing, because the only things we can see are straight lines. If this sounds confusing, let me give you an example, which you can follow along with while you read. <clears throat> get, a small coin or, or similar, get a small coin or similar thin object and place it in the middle of one of your tables in Spaceland. When you stand above it and look down, you see the coin as a circle. But if you move to the edge of the table and lower yourself partway towards the ground, more like the way we flatlanders see the world, you'll see that the coin now looks less like a circle and more like an oval. Then if your eye is level with the edge of the table, you are closest to what we can get to being you are closest to what you can get to being on our level. You'll see that the penny, seen from above as a circle, now appears to just be a straight line. The same thing would happen if you did this with a triangle, or square, or any other shape you could cut out of cardboard. As soon as you look at it with your eye on the table, it looks like a straight line. Take, for example, an equilateral triangle, who with us is a tradesman or businessman of the respectable class. Figure 1 below represents the trademen, tradesman as you would see him while you were bending over from above as a triangle with all three sides of equal length. Figure 2 and 3 represent the trademen, tradesman, as you would see him if you began to move your eye closer to the level of the table. Figure 4 represents what you would see with your eye were lower with the table, level with the table, nothing but a straight line, which is how we see him in Flatland. Image description start. Figures 1, 2, 3, and 4. Each is a very simple black and white illustration of an equal-sided triangle seen from different angles, first from above, where he is plainly seen as a triangle, then slowly moving the view down so that he gets flatter and flatter until he is nothing but a straight line. Image description end. When I visited Spaceland, among other things not worth talking about in detail, I was told that your sailors have a similar experience when they're out on the ocean. Distant lands might obviously have bays, cliffs, buildings, and all kinds of shapes on them from close by, but until you get close enough, or unless the sun's bright enough to cast clear shadows, all you can see at a distance is a gray line on the horizon. That's like what we see when a, one of our triangular or other acquaintances comes towards us in Flatland. We have no shadows like you do, and none of the other advantages your vision has in Spaceland. If our friend comes closer to us, he becomes larger. If he goes away, he becomes smaller, but he has always a straight line. It doesn't matter if he's a triangle, square, pentagon, hexagon, circle, or anything else. He always looks like a straight line, and nothing else. You'll of course be wondering how we tell each other apart if this is all we can see, and I and I'll be able to make you understand better once I finish describing the people who live in Flatland. But for the moment, let me pause this subject and instead tell you about our houses and the environment of Flatland. <clears throat> Section 2 of the Climate and Houses in Flatland Like in your world, we also have four points in our compass, north, south, east, and west. Since we have no sun or other celestial bodies like you do, we can't tell where north is in the way you do, but we have our own way. Similar to your birds, we always know where south is, because for us, we are constantly being pulled in that direction. This pull is very light in our most northern countries, so light that even a reasonably healthy woman can travel for several hundred yards northward without difficulty. But even at its slightest, but even at its lightest, we can still feel it, and can use this to tell which way is south. 
as an added bonus the rain which always falls on a predictable schedule always comes from the north because of this when we are in a town or city we can tell the direction from the way the houses are built because the rain comes from the north the solid roof faces north so that the water can safely run off and down the sides without getting inside when you're out in the countryside where there are no houses you can use the trunks of trees instead as you can see it's usually pretty easy for us to get our bearings but one problem is that when you are so far north that you can barely full feel this pull. If you are walking in a deserted plain with no trees or houses in sight, I've sometimes gotten so turned around that I had to stand in place for hours straight, waiting for the rain to come so I'd know which way to go. If you are ill or old or a delicate female, this pull to the south weighs heavier than on healthy members of the male sex, so it's considered polite that, if you meet a lady on the street, you will move to the south and give her the north side to walk on. This can be easier said than done in such short notice if you are in a northern climate where it's hard to tell which way is south or if you're feeling sick yourself. Unlike your building, unlike your buildings, ours have no windows because light comes to us evenly equally. Because light comes to us everywhere equally, whether you're inside or out, during the day or night, and where this light comes from, we don't know. A long time ago, philosophers and scholars used to ask each other, what is the origin of light? and debate the possible answers. Many people have tried to find the answer to this question, and the only result is that our lunatic asylums have precious space taken up by the people who have claimed to have solved it. Our government tried to persuade people to stop trying to solve this problem by forcing anyone who worked on it to pay heavy taxes, but when it kept being a problem, the lawmakers, not so long ago comparatively speaking, finally made it completely illegal to talk about. And here I am, the only one in Flatland who knows the truth to where light comes from. But I can't explain it to my countrymen, and when I try, they just laugh at me. Me! The only one in this world who understands that light comes from the third dimension. They laugh at me like I'm the maddest of the mad. But I've gotten off track, but I've gotten off track and this is a painful topic, so let's get back to talking about houses. Most of our houses are five-sided shapes, or as they are commonly called, pentagons. Here is an illustration to help you understand. Image description start. A black and white digital illustration with the compass in the upper left corner showing a pentagonal house in flatland. Each of the five points of the pentagon are with a different letter with A and B going left to right on the bottom line and R, O, and F left to right on the top with two digital, digital lines marked with their combined points so that the roof, so that the rooftops two so that the rooftop's two diagonal lines spell out roof. On the western diagonal side is a large gap marked by a gray line labeled men's door. On the east side is a much smaller gap labeled women's door. Image description end. The two northern sides of Pentagon house form the roof, and these normally don't have any doors. On the eastern side, there is a small door for women, and across from it on the western side is a much larger door for men. The southern side, or floor, usually doesn't have any doors. Square and triangular houses aren't allowed because their angles are much sharper than those of a pentagon, and since the lines of in inanimate objects like houses are dimmer than the lines of men and women, they are harder to see, so if someone wasn't paying attention, they could get seriously hurt if they accidentally ran into the corner of a square or triangle-shaped house. As far back as the 11th century of our era, triangular houses have been illegal to build, with the only exceptions being for military structures like forts, ammunition stores, and barracks, or other state buildings that most people aren't allowed to enter without special permission. At that point in time, you, will st you were still allowed to build square houses, but they were subject to special taxes to discourage people from building more of them. 300 years after triangular houses were outlawed, the law finally decided that if a town's population was above 10,000, then the angle of a pentagon was the smallest house angle allowed to be built in the interest of public safety. The general community has common sense and has agreed with this new law, so now, even out in the country on farms, almost all houses you can you can find will be pentagons. Now and then, though, in some very remote and poor farming district, an antiquarian might still find an ancient square house. <clears throat> Section 3. 
concerning the inhabitants of flatland. Most adult flatlanders will reach a length of around 11 of your inches or 28 centimeters. 12 inches or around 30 centimeters is considered the natural limit. Our women are straight lines. Our expendable soldiers and the lowest classes of laborers are triangles with two equal sides about 11 inches or 28 centimeters long with their third side or base so short usually less than half an inch or two centimeters that they form at their vertices an extremely sharp sharp angle or point. When these sort of triangles have a base of the most degraded type, less than an eighth of an inch or three millimeters, it's almost impossible to tell them apart from straight lines or women, so sharp are their needle-like points. Just like you do in Spaceland, we refer to these kinds of triangles as isosceles, which is how I will refer to them from now on. Our middle class consists of equilateral and equal-sided triangles. Our doctors and lawyers and gentlemen are squares, which is the class I belong to, and five-sided figures, otherwise known as pentagons, as mentioned above. Above us are the nobility, with several classes, starting with six-sided figures or hexagons. After hexagons, the number of sides increases until one is given the honorable title of poly polygonal, 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 I don't know how you say that properly, or many-sided. When the number of one's sides becomes so high, and the sides themselves each so small that the figure can't be told apart from a circle, he becomes part of the circular or priestly order. There is no class higher than that of circles. It is a law of nature with us that a male child will have one more side than his father, so that each generation rises in the ranks of nobility, as a rule. This means that a square, four sides, will have pentagonal sons, five sides, and his grandsons will be hexagons, six sides, and his great-grandsons will be septagons, seven sides, and his great-great-grandsons will be octagons, eight sides, and so on and so forth. But this rule doesn't always apply to the tradesmen, the equilateral triangles, and it's even less common in the isosceles soldiers and workers. But, to be fair, you can they can hardly even be described as human beings since their sides aren't of all equal length. Because they're subhuman, this law of nature doesn't work on them, and most of the time, the son of an isosceles is still an isosceles. But things aren't entirely hopeless. Your children's position in society can always get better, even if you're one of the most degraded of isosceles through hard work, dedication, and many successful military campaigns. Often, when workers and soldiers prove themselves to be smarter than their peers, when they are measured again, the measurements will show that their third side, or base, has grown, while their two longer points have shrunk, producing a larger angle at the vertex. The priests then graciously become involved, arranging the marriage of these lucky isosceles to a suitable straight line, and the sons born to these arranged marriages are almost always born with larger angles than their fathers, much closer to being an equal-sided triangle than those who married for love. Very, very, very rarely, a true, certifiable, equal-sided triangle is born to isosceles parents. And a, critic might, and a critic might ask, but why does he need to be certified? When he eventually gives birth to a square son, isn't that a certificate from nature herself proving that he's truly equal-sided? And I tell you that no self-respecting lady would ever consent to marry an uncertified triangle. Square sons are sometimes born to slightly irregular triangles, which would seem like a cause for celebration, but almost every time the triangle's irregularity is passed down to his grandson, who either fails to attain the rank of pentagon by instead being born a square, or relapses entirely by being born a triangle. If an equilateral triangle has any hope of being born to isosceles parents, there must be a careful plan of arranged marriages for several generations, as well as strict self-control and frugality. Each generation needs to become smarter than their parents and make sure that their children are smarter than they are for many generations. When a true equilateral triangle is born to isosceles parents, the birth is celebrated for many miles around. The Sanitary and Social Board performs a strict, ex a strict examination of the newborn, and if he is certified as regular, he is, with all due seriousness, conducted into the class of equilaterals. He is then immediately taken away from his proud, sorrowing isosceles parents and adopted by an equilateral who has no children of his own, who has to promise never to let this, his adopted child go to the area where he was born or even look at his biological parents in case he mimics them without realizing and reverts to a degraded isosceles. 
the rare birth of an equilateral from the masses of slaves is not only welcomed by the slaves themselves as proof that their that their hope of their children climbing the social ladder isn't misplaced but it also gives them something to be temporarily happy about in their otherwise miserable lives like a sudden surprise holiday such an event is also welcomed by the aristocracy i cannot say that word such an event is also welcomed by the aristocracy the higher classes know that their own social status won't be threatened by these births because it's really the exact opposite these births help maintain their power if the acute angled rabble had been completely absolutely without hope and ambition it would have given rise to many leaders to start their rebellious phases and with their superior numbers and strength they would have been too much for even the wisdom of the circles to handle but nature is even wiser and has decided that as the working classes get smarter they also get weaker as their acute angle which makes them so dangerous and stupid grows wider getting closer to the comparatively harmless angle of an equilateral triangle in the most brutal acute and threatening of the isosceles creatures almost on the same level of women with their lack of angle and, intelli and intelligence their ability to kill is matched by their inability to plan how to do so efficiently and in return when their descendants have finally become smart enough to plan what would be devastating acts of terrorism they're no longer physically capable of carrying them out image description start a black and white illustration with a black border titled the law of compensation in the center of the diagram are five triangles starting from so acute it's almost a straight line until it becomes a much wider equal sided triangle and above and below are scales the first is labeled intelligence and it increases as the shape gets wider the second below is labeled physical threat and it decreases as a strength as the shape gets wider image description end How admirable, how admirable is this law of compensation? It just goes to show how natural and, dare I say, divinely inspired, the structure of our society is here in Flatland. It is as if nature herself is helping our great polygons and circles to kill the rebellion in the cradle. Art, too, comes to the aid of law and order. Our doctors can usually figure out a way, through artificial compression or expansion of the exoskeleton, to make the more intelligent leaders of any given isosceles isosceles rebellion become equilaterals allowing them to immediately join the privileged higher classes many of these many more of these rebel leaders though are far too below the standard for intelligence to be allowed the surgery but bewitched by the promise of becoming regular through similar treatment they are tricked into entering the state hospitals which they will never be allowed to leave they spend the rest of their lives honorably honorably confined to these hospitals only a few of the more obstinate, foolish, or highly irregular of the rebel leaders are actually put to death. And then, the and then the rabble of the isosceles, without a plan, without leadership, are either killed without resistance by the small group of isosceles assassins, isosceles assassins the chief circle pays in case of emergencies such as this, or more often, thanks to the suspicious suspicions and infighting stirred up by the circular party begin attacking and killing each other until none of them are left alive there are 120 rebellions recorded in our state records and a further 235 minor outbreaks all of them have ended as i have described above section four concerning the women now that you understand how dangerous our highly pointed isosceles triangles are, you can understand how much more dangerous our women are. Because if an isosceles is a wedge, a woman is a needle made up, you might say, nothing but made up of, you might say, nothing but points, at least at the two ends. Add to this sharpness a woman's ability to make herself practically invisible at will, and you'll see that the females of Flatland are not the kind of creatures you want to mess with. But maybe some of my younger readers are confused and thinking, but how can a woman in Flatland make herself invisible? I think the answer is pretty obvious, but it won't take very long to explain, so even those who aren't paying full attention will understand. Place a needle or another long, thin object, like a pencil, on a table. Then lower yourself until your eye is level with the surface of the table, and look at your line from the side, and you'll see its whole length. But if you turn it so that you are looking at it straight from the front or back, you will see nothing but a small point. This is what happens with our women. When her side is towards us, we see her 
<clears throat> when her side is towards us, we see her as a straight line. With her head or when her front or head, in your terms, the part containing her eye or mouth, which for us is the same organ, is pointed at us, we see a bright point. But when her back is pointed towards us, we see a dim light, so dim it's almost as dark as an inanimate object. And this is how a woman, by simply turning her back on you, can become practically invisible. Image description start. A black and white diagram with a white background and a black border. On the left is a drawing of an eye as seen from the side, with dotted lines radiating out to show the line of sight. This eye is looking downwards on a straight line, and is labeled a straight line viewed from the side. The next is looking at the at the side. The next is looking to the side at a tiny dot that is marked by a large arrow, so you notice it, and this eye is labeled a straight line viewed from the front or back. Image description end. <clears throat> I need to make it clear to you just how dangerous our women are. If running into an equilateral triangle, whose angle is 60 degrees, will give you a painful gash, then running into an officer of the military class, an isosceles, will give you a serious wound. If a mere accidental bump from the vertex of a private soldier, one of the lowest of the isosceles, is life-threatening, then what can you expect from running into a woman except complete and total annihilation? And when a woman is almost invisible like this, imagine how difficult it is, even for the most cautious, to avoid running into them. Many laws have been put into place in the different countries of Flatland in order to reduce this danger, and in the southern and less temperate environments where the force of the southern pull, or gravity, is greater, where human beings are more likely to have sudden and vind and involuntary movements from constantly fighting the gravity, the laws regarding women are, naturally, much stricter and harsher. But a general view of the regulations for women can be understood from the following summary. 1. Every house will have one entrance on the eastern side to be used only by females, and all females must enter in a becoming and respectful manner. Females must never use the, men or the men's or western door. Note from the author, when I was in Spaceland, I was told, in a conversation not transcribed in this book to save my readers valuable time, that some of your religious buildings have a similar policy and a separate entrance for the working poor so that they can also approach in a becoming and respectful manner. 2. No female shall walk in any public place without continually keeping up her peace cry under penalty of death. 3. Any female diagnosed with St. Vitus's dance, a neurological disorder causing sudden involuntary movements after an illness, usually affecting children, seizures, a chronic cold accompanied by violent sneezing, or any other disease that causes involuntary movements, shall be destroyed immediately upon diagnosis. In some countries, there is another law that forbids females, under penalty of death, from walking or standing in public place in public spaces without constantly moving their backside, without moving their backs from side to side so that people behind them can see them better. Let me get a drink quick. Other countries will sometimes demand that any woman in public should be followed by one of her male family members or servants, and still others ban women from public entirely, confining them to their homes except during religious festivals. But our wisest of priests, or, but our wisest of circles and politicians have found that having so many restrictions on women not only leads to the weakening of our society overall, but also to an extremely high number of domestic murders, to the point where the number of men killed as a result far outnumbers the accidents that the law was attempting to avoid in the first place. Because when the temper of a woman is stoked by being confined to her home, or having to deal with harsh, inconvenient restrictions when in public, they are likely to unleash their fury upon their husbands and children or siblings. Several times, in countries with highly restrictive laws, the entire male population of a town has sometimes been wiped out in just a few hours, as the females simultaneously and violently succumb to their wrath. And this is why the first three laws I've outlined here are good enough for their own, 
and this is why the first three laws I've outlined here are good enough on their own for the better run countries such as the one I belong to and can be used as a rough summary of our female code. After all, it's not the law itself that protects us so much as the instinct for self-preservation in the women themselves. It is true that they can conflict instinct. It is true that they can inflict instant death by simply moving backwards, but it is also true that unless they can immediately remove their stabbing end, their own fragile, body, own fragile bodies can be easily can easily be shattered by the. D <laughs> Let's start that over. It is true that they can. can bleh. It is true that they can inflict instant death by simply moving backwards, but it is also true that unless they immediately remove their stabbing end, their own fragile bodies can easily be shattered by the death throes of their victim, and the women will be killed along with them. The power of fashion is also on our side. I said above that in some less civilized countries, females are not allowed in public without swaying her back from side to side. But in my country, our high-ranking and ambitious ladies have been doing this of their own free will since as far back as anyone can remember. The idea that a law would have to be passed to guarantee this behavior, which should be instinctive in ladies of high breeding, is extremely embarrassing. The rhythmic, the rhythmic and if I may say so, well-modulated undulation of the back in our ladies' married to circles is envied by, is envied by the wives of Eli <laughs> is envied envied i can't talk the rhythmic and if i may say so well modulated undulation of the back and a loud truck in our ladies married to circles is envied by the wives of equilaterals who trying their best can only create a regular twitch like the ticking of a clock <clears throat> But even that simple ticking is admired by the wife of the ambitious isosceles, who wishes to raise her family's status, so that she becomes the first in all her family line to practice the art of back motion. So you see, in every family worth considering, back motion is as old and ingrained as time itself, and the lucky male members of these families enjoy their immunity from invisible attacks. But don't get me wrong, I'm not saying our women don't care about their families. It's just that, unfortunately, their emotions in the moment overpower their other feelings, driving out every other thought until their anger passes. This, of course, is the result of the unfortunate configura- This, of course, is the result of their unfortunate configuration as straight lines. They have no angle to speak of, and thus are mentally and physically inferior to even the very lowest of the isosceles. They are, as a result of this lack of angle, completely devoid of brain power, and are completely incapable of self-reflection, judgment, or planning, and barely any memory at all. This is why, when you are in the, this is why, when they are in a state of fury, they have no idea what they're doing or who they're doing it to. They will not recognize their husband or even their children. I've actually heard of a legal case where a woman murdered everyone in her whole household, but then half an hour later, when she'd calmed down and the fragmented bodies had been swept away by police, asked them where her husband and children were. She didn't remember a thing. So it should be obvious that you shouldn't annoy a woman if she's able to turn around and stab you. But when you have them in their apartments, which are built so narrowly specifically to prevent them from turning and attacking, you can say or do whatever you want, because they're incapable of reacting in any way except through speech, and in a few minutes, they won't even remember whatever it is you've said or done that they're threatening to kill you for, nor will they remember the hasty promises you've made, with no intention of keeping, to get them to calm down again. In general, we get along pretty well with our women, except in the lower classes of the isosceles military. These isosceles, lacking in angle, and also lacking in tact and discretion, and many times these isosceles lacking in angle also lack in tact and discretion, and many times this has caused indescribable disasters. These isosceles rely too much on their sharp points as weapons instead of the shield of common sense and knowing how to react to different problems, so these reckless creatures often fail to properly follow the safety code for building women's apartments or irritate their wives by insulting them when out in public, and then to make matters worse, refuse to immediately apologize. And, being simple creatures who are too fond of the literal truth, these isosceles refuse to make the kinds of lavish, impossible promises that circles readily deploy to pacify the would-be murderess. The result of this lack of careful handling is massacre, 
but you shouldn't see it as a tragedy. On the contrary, these outbreaks eliminate the more brutal and troublesome of the isosceles, and many of our circles view the destructiveness of the thinner sex as one of the many favors Providence has given us for naturally suppressing the population of isosceles and helping to nip revolution in the bud. Change how I'm sitting quick. <clears throat> But even within the families that most strictly follow the female code, even with our closest to true circles, circular families, I have to admit our idea of domestic bliss isn't as full of affection and comfort as it is with you in Spaceland. There is peace, if the absence of slaughter can be called peace, but it is impossible for there to be shared interests or hobbies between man and wife, with the man's safety paid for by the loss of true comfort and companionship. <clears throat> Since time immemorial, the women of our circular and polygon polygonal houses have had the habit, which has now become a kind of instinct, of always keeping their eyes and mouths pointed towards their husband and his male friends. If a lady in a high-ranking family turned her back on her husband, it would be seen as an omen of disaster, threatening a huge loss of social status. But, as I will soon explain, this custom, while ensuring safety, is not without its problems. In the house of the isosceles working man or the equilateral tradesman, where the wife is allowed to turn her back on her husband while performing her household duties, there are moments of peace, where the wife is neither seen nor heard, except the humming of her except the humming sound of her ever present peace cry. But in the homes of the upper classes, these moments of peace are few and far between. There, the loud and bright face of the wife are always directed at the master of the household, and not even the never-changing light is more persistent than the never-ending feminine chatter. The diplomatic skill required to avoid a woman's string the diplomatic skill required to avoid a woman's sting has no power against a woman's mouth, and since the wife has absolutely nothing meaningful to say, and no intelligence or conscience there to prevent her from speaking anyway, more than a few cynics have been quoted with saying that they prefer the death-dealing but mercifully silent sting of a woman's back end to the obnoxious volume of her, of her mouth. To my readers in Spaceland, the condition of our women may seem truly miserable, and indeed it is, without question. A male of even the lowest type of isosceles can look forward to some improvement of his angle through hard work and dedication, and eventually the increased rank of his entire degraded caste, but no woman can ever hope for such things for her own sex. Once a woman, always a woman, is a decree of nature, and the very laws of evolution seem to stack misfortunes against her. But at least we can admire the wise arrangement evolution and nature have given us, so that even though the woman, so that even though the women have to be miserable for our great society to exist, at least they'll soon forget it. <clears throat> Section five of our methods of recognizing one another. You, who are blessed with the ability to perceive shading as well as light, whose people are gifted with not one but two eyes, who understand perspective, who get to enjoy all shades of color without thinking about it, you who can actually see an angle and see the complete circumference of a circle from your happy, elevated position in the third dimension without a single speck of effort, how can I make you understand how difficult it is for us in Flatland to recognize one another? Remember what I ex Remember what I already explained to you earlier? All things in Flatland, alive or inanimate, no matter what their shape, appear to be, to our view, the same as a straight line. So then how can we tell one shape from another when all shapes look the same? The answer is threefold. The first way of recognizing different shapes is a sense of hearing, which with us is so much more highly developed than it is with you in Spaceland, and not only lets us recognize the voices of our friends, but even to tell which class someone belongs, at least as far as the lower three classes the equilateral, square, and pentagon go. As for the isosceles, well, there's no telling. As we rise in social standing, it becomes harder and harder to tell people's classes apart by their voice, partly because the higher classes all speak in similar ways, and partly because using someone's accent to judge their class is a poor man's skill, poor man's skill that is looked down upon by the aristocracy. And if there's any danger of offending someone more important than us, we can't trust this skill, because among the lowest because among the lowest classes, the vocal organs are more strongly developed, so that an isosceles can easily fake the accent of a polygon, 
and, with some training, even a circle himself. So a second method is more commonly used. Feeling, among our women and lower classes, I'll explain shortly about our higher classes, is the main test of recognition in most cases between strangers, and also when the question is not to the individual's identity, but his class. As a result, what you in Spaceland call a formal introduction is the equivalent of feeling with us. <clears throat> For our more old-fashioned gentlemen who live in the country, permit me to ask you to feel and be felt by my friend Mr. Smith is still the go-to phrase. But in the towns and among businessmen, the words be felt by are cut out and the sentence is shortened to, let me ask you to feel Mr. Smith, and it is just assumed that the feeling will bo go both ways. Among our younger, more modern, and dashing young gentlemen who refuse to expend any extra effort than necessary and don't care at all about protecting the sanctity of their language, the phrase is shortened even more, using the words to feel as a shortcut for to recommend for the purpose of feeling and being felt. At the time this book was written, this slang of the newest generation allows such disgraceful barbarism as the sentence, Mr. Smith, permit me to feel Mr. Jones, to exist. But please, my readers, don't assume that feeling for us is as awkward and tedious as it would be for you, or that we have to go all the way around the person, feeling all his sides, before we can figure out what class he belongs to. Years of practice and training, started in school and continued in daily life, allow us to immediately tell apart the angle of an equilateral, of an equal-sided triangle, square, or pentagon at a single touch. And I don't think I need to explain how the brainless vertex of an acute angled isosceles is obvious even to the dullest touch. That is why, as a general rule, we don't need to feel more than a single angle of an individual, and this by itself can tell us the class this person belongs to, unless he belongs to one of the higher sections of the nobility, where things become much more difficult. Even a Master of Arts from our University of Wentbridge has gotten a 10-sided and 12-sided polygon confused, and there is no doctor of science, in or out of that university, who would pretend to know, without hesitation, the difference between 20-sided or icosagon, and a 24-sided, or icocytetragon, member of the aristocracy. The readers who have been paying attention and remember what I said earlier about our women's code should quickly understand that the process of feeling requires serious caution and self-control, otherwise the angles of the one being felt might seriously injure the feeler. It is essential for the safety of the feeler that the felt should stand completely still. A single twitch, any fidgeting, and yes, even something as simple as a violent sneeze can prove fatal. Things like this have ended many promising friendships before they could even begin. There's another typo. This is especially true with the lower classes of isosceles. Their eyes are positioned so far from their sharpest point that they can barely see what's happening at their most dangerous end. These triangles are also literally insensitive and can barely feel the much more refined touch of a highly bred polygon, so no one can really be surprised if a sudden toss of the head deprives the state of a valuable life. I've heard that my honorable grandfather, one of the least irregular of his unhappy isosceles class, who obtained shortly before his death four of seven votes from the sanitary and social board to let him be certified as an equal-sided triangle, often bemoaned, with a tear in his venerable eye, an accident of the kind I've just described to you, which happened to his great-great-great-grandfather, a respectable working man with an angle, or brain, of 59 degrees, 30 minutes. According to this story, my unfortunate great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, who was suffering from rheumatism and while being felt by a polygon, with one sudden, unintentional movement, he accidentally transfixed the great man in a horrific stabbing straight through the diagonal. Half because of his long suffering in prison, and half because of the moral shock that swept through all of my ancestors' relatives, our family's angle was thrown, by, was thrown back by a degree and a half, cutting off their rise to higher status. This resulted in the next generation of the family brain being measured at only 58 degrees, and it wasn't until five whole generations passed that the lost ground was, was recovered and the full 60 degrees obtained, finally lifting my family out of the class of isosceles. <clears throat> and to think that this whole series of calamities all came from one little accident in the process of feeling. And I think at this point I can hear some of my readers exclaiming, How can you Flatlanders know anything about angles, degrees, or minutes? 
We can see an angle from spaceland because we can see two straight lines connecting to form an angle, but you flatlanders can only ever see one line or just a few pieces of different lines in a bigger line. How can you hope to measure any angle, let alone measure angles of different sizes? My answer is that while we can't see angles, we can infer them and to do and do so with great accuracy. Our sense of touch, trained through constant use, lets us tell angles apart far more accurately than you can with the naked eye. We have many natural advantages that shouldn't be forgotten. It is a law of nature that the brain of an isosceles class begins at half a degree of angle, or 30 minutes, and if it increases, it will do so by half a degree for every generation until the goal of 60 degrees is reached, when the newest free when the newest Freeman generation leaves behind the condition of slavery and joins the class of the regulars. This means that nature herself gives us the tools we need in the form of an ascending scale or alphabet of angles for every half a degree all the way up to 60 degrees, giving us all of the examples we need. <clears throat> giving us all of the examples we need, specimens of which are placed in every elementary school throughout the land. Due to occasional slipbacks like the kind my family suffered, as well as frequent moral and intellectual stagnation, not to mention the extraordinary ability of the criminal and vagabond classes to breed, there is always a vast pool of indivi individuals with half there is always a vast pool of individuals with an angle of half a degree or a single degree, and a fair abundance of specimens up to ten degrees. There are these are absolutely divs bleh, hold on. <clears throat> These are absolutely destitute of civic rights, and many of them are too stupid to even be useful in warfare, so they are given from the skate and to the schools to be used for education. Shackled so tightly that they cannot move in any way to remove all possibility of danger, they are placed in our kindergarten classrooms and are used by the Board of Education to teach the young equilateral triangles that have been adopted away from their biological parents, the proper tact and intelligent that the wretched isosceles who produce them are completely lacking in. In some countries, these chained specimens are sometimes given food and water, and as a result are allowed to suffer through life for several years after their capture. But in better run areas, we know that these educa but in better run areas, we know that the educational interests of the children are better served with saving the cost of the food and simply getting new specimens every month, which is about how long a member of the criminal class can last before starving to death. The cheaper schools, which choose to prolong the life of the specimen, lose in the long run by the cost of the food and water, and partly in the lessened accuracy of the specimen's angles, which, after a, week's, uh, after a few weeks of constant feeling, become damaged. And when we think of the advantages of the more expensive system of, constant, of constantly replacing specimens, let's not forget that it helps, however slightly, to lower the numbers of the isosceles population, which is a goal that every statesman in Flatland continent constantly keeps in mind. This is why I think, even though many of our popularly elected school boards prefer the cheap system, that the more expensive system is, in this case, the best use of the money. But I shouldn't let the politics of school boards distract me from my real subject. I've said enough, I hope, to show that recognition by feeling isn't as tedious or confusing a process as you might assume, and it is also obviously more trustworthy than recognition by hearing. But many argue, rightfully, that this method can be, can be very dangerous. This is why many in the middle and lower classes, and almost all of those in the po polygonal or circular classes, prefer a th third method of recognition that I will explain to you in the section below. <clears throat> section 6, of Recognition by Sight. I am about to seem very inconsistent. In the previous sections, I've told you that all things in Flatland appear to us to be nothing but a straight line, and it was implied that, that this makes it impossible to tell people or objects apart by looking at them. But I will now explain. But I will now be. But now I will be explaining to my Spaceland critics how we Flatlanders do recognize one another by our sense of sight. If you, the reader, will take the time to revisit the paragraph where you think I claim that recognition by feeling is universal, you will see that I specified among the lower classes. Only among the higher classes in our civilized society is sight recognition practiced. This skill can be practiced anywhere, for any class. 
that this skill can be practiced anywhere for any class is the result of the fog that covers our land for most of the year in all parts of flatland except in deserts what spacelanders see as a depressing evil smog that blots out the landscape and makes you cold and sick we celebrate and see as a blessing second only to air itself and is recognized as the nurse of art and the parent of science but I'll try to stop singing praises for this generous element so that I can explain to you what I mean. If fog didn't exist, all lines would appear just as sharp and clear as every other line, and this is actually the case in those unhappy desert countries where the atmosphere is perfectly dry and transparent. But wherever fog can be found, objects that are at a distance of, for example, three feet, are noticeably dimmer than those at a distance of two, foot, of two feet and eleven inches. This means that by careful, constant observation, we are able to understand, with very high accuracy, the shape of the object we are looking at. It's a weird drill or something outside. A specific example will let me make my meaning clear to you without needing many more paragraphs of explanation. Imagine that I see two strangers approaching me, whose rank I want to learn. Let's say they are a merchant and a physician, or in other words, an equilateral triangle and a pentagon. So how do I tell them apart? Here is a diagram to illustrate. <clears throat> Image description start. A black and white illustration showing an equilateral triangle and a pentagon with a drawing of an eye seen from the side pointed at each of them. The point facing the eye is labeled A, the point below is B, and the point above is C. A thin line traces the peripheral vision of the eye and a vertical, and a vertical rectangle in front of the point A shows that the eye of the flatlander can see a straight line in a gradient of white at the center and darker at the edges. The triangle's edges become darker faster than the pentagon's. Image description end. It will immediately... Be <clears throat> it will immediately become obvious to every child in Spaceland who knows anything about geometry that if I am facing these two men so that I am looking directly at their front point, A, my view, obviously, lies bet perfectly between the two points on either side of that, CA, AB, so that both points appear to be the same size. Now when I look at an equilateral merchant, what will I see? I will see a straight line, in reality made up of three points, with the center of the line, which is really point A, being very bright, because point A is closest to me. The two seeming ends of the line, though, will be much darker, with a very sudden shift from the white at the center to almost black. This is because the points, C, B, and C, that make up the ends of the seeming line are much further away from me, with more fog covering them. On the other hand, the line that represents the, pentagonal phys the pentagon position will shift from light to from a white to a lighter gray rather than almost black because the points that make up the ends of the line are not as far away from me than they were on the triangle. Note from the second editor. To simplify further, the closer the point is to you, the brighter it is. The further away, the darker it is. Just remember this and you'll be fine. <clears throat> the reader will probably understand from this example from this example how, after a very long course of training aided by constant practical experience, those of us who are well educated can easily tell strangers apart when it comes to the equilateral and isosceles classes by our sense of sight. If my spaceland friends have grasped this idea enough that you're not immediately rejecting it as impossible, I'll consider my job done in this matter. If I tried to give you any more details, I'd only confuse you hopelessly. But for the sake of the young and experienced who might assume, from the two examples I gave above of how, of how I would recognize my father and one of my sons, that recognition of sight is easy to learn, I feel the need to point out that, in reality, the problems posed by sight recognition are much more subtle and complex than my simple diagram can convey to those in Spaceland. For example, if my father, the, elect, the equilateral triangle pictured above, were to approach me with one of his sides instead of his angle, then until I've asked him to rotate, or until I move around him to another angle, I cannot be certain whether I am looking at my father, the equilateral triangle, or straight line, which in other words means a woman. Then, when I am with one of my two hexagonal grandsons looking at one of his sides, it will be clear, I hope, from the diagram below, that I will be see a straight line with a large center of brightness, made up by the points A and B, with two smaller, darker sections above and below, which qu quickly fade away into dimness.
image description start. A black and white illustration showing a hexagon being looked at from the side so that one of the flat sides created by points A and B is facing the eye, with points C and D above and below. The flatlander's eye perceives a straight line with a large white center, with the very top and bottom sections suddenly turning dark and fading even darker at the ends. Image description end. <clears throat> But I need to resist the temptation to keep explaining about these topics. Even the best mathematician in Spaceland would believe me when I tell you that when you are at a party or a convention, moving around the room and other people, trying to recognize and keep track of the many high-ranking polygons around you is not an easy task. This is why we value our expert mathematicians, professors of, professors of both static and kinetic geometry from the University of Wentbridge, so highly. They are the ones who teach the elites of the states the complex art of site recognition. It is only a few of the most promising sons of our most noble and wealthy houses who can afford the time and money necessary for actually mastering this noble and valuable art. If I, a mathematician of fair skill and the grandfather of two very promising and perfectly regular hexagons, find myself in the middle of a crowd of rotating polygons of the higher classes, even I sometimes find myself unsure. And of course, to a common tradesman, equilateral, or slave isosceles, such a sight must be as bewildering and meaningless as it would be to you, my dear reader, if you were suddenly transported to our country. In a crowd like this, the only thing you would see, wherever you look, is nothing but a line that seems to be straight, but with different parts and constantly changing light or darkness. Even if you had graduated from your third year in the university's classes for pentagons and hexagons, and had memorized the theory of the subject, you would quickly find yourself realizing that it will take many years of practical experience before you could confidently move through a high society crowd without bumping into your betters. <clears throat> it is impolite in the extreme to ask to feel such superior nobles, and it is without a doubt due to their superior culture and breeding that these fashionable crowns Crowds know everything of your shape and movements, while you, still inexperienced, know next to nothing about theirs. In other words, the only way to truly belong in a poly polygonal society is to be a polygon yourself. It is a painful lesson I have had to learn the hard way. <clears throat> it is astonishing how much the art, I like to call it an instinct, of sight recognition is honed by sim simply by constant practice, while avoiding the custom of feeling. Note from the second editor, I apologize in advance for the next sentence you are going to read after this interruption is done. The author here, as you may be able to guess soon enough, thinks he knows more than he does. I will state now for the record that his idea of how deaf and nonverbal people learn to speak is completely and blatantly false, a myth long since thrown away, but I will still transcribe his words here for the sake of posterity and to better help you understand his mindset. Let me make it absolutely clear that denying deaf, nonverbal, and semi-verbal children access to sign language or augmentative, or augmentative and alternative communication devices (AAC) and forcing them to lip read or spend years learning to speak perfectly aloud does not help them learn to communicate better. The only thing it accomplishes is isolating them and punishing them and delaying their ability to talk to you. Let them learn sign language, and you can learn it alongside them. Get them an AAC device. Stop trying to fit a square through a circular hole. It is a myth that sign language stops deaf and mute children from speaking. Just because you didn't bother to learn doesn't mean they're not talking. Interruption over now. You may continue. Just as with you, if the deaf and mute are allowed to gesticulate and use sign language, will never acquire the more difficult but far more valuable art of speech and lip reading, so it, so it is with us as regarding seeing and feeling. No one who learns pff, that's lots of typos. No one who learns feeling early in life will ever learn seeing in perfection. This is why feeling is either discouraged or forbidden completely among the families of our higher classes. The children of high class polygons are not sent to the common public elementary schools where feeling is taught. Instead, they are sent to private schools with very strict entrance requirements. At these schools to feel is to be is seen as a serious problem and is punished with the suspension for the first offense and complete expulsion for the second. But the lower classes think of sight recognition as an unattain unobtainable luxury. Pause quick while I get another drink. The 
common equilateral tradesman can't afford to send even just one of his sons away to spend an entire third of his life studying abstract ideas. So the children of the poor are allowed to feel as soon as they begin moving, and in doing so become practiced at moving and interacting with others very quickly, which makes them seem, to the untrained eye, much better developed than the comparatively listless, unmoving attitudes of young noble polygons at the same age. Hi. Hold on, I have a cat talking to me. Want to say hi to for YouTube? But don't let this disparity fool you. Once the young polygons have finally completed their course with the university and are ready to go out into the world to gain more experience, a change sweeps over them so that they seem to be born for a second time. In all the skills of art, science, and sociability, they then rapidly catch up to catch up to and outcompete their triangular competitors with ease. It is rare for any of the polygonal class to fail their final test of the university, but it does happen promising a life of pitiable misery to, pitiable misery misery I don't know why I'm trying to say that misery be. it is rare for any of the polygonal class to fail their final test at the university but it does happen promising a life of pitiable misery to these unsuccessful nobles cast out by other polygons they can make no friends among the common classes either they cannot function in polygonal society because of their lack of sight recognition, but also have no idea how to navigate by feel, as they've been forbidden and shamed out of learning it their whole lives. There are no jobs they can perform, either professional or common, and though most countries do not actually ban them from getting married, it is still difficult for them to find any willing partners, since history has shown us that the children of such marriages will be, at best, similarly unfit for the noble life, or, at worst, blatantly irregular. This trash of the nobility is where many of the leaders of the various tumults and seditions of the past have arisen. So many, in fact, that the increasing number that an, that an increasing number of our progressive statesmen statesmen have decided that either imprisoning these wretched outcasts for life, or at least mercy killing them, would make life easier for everyone. <clears throat> But I am once again becoming distracted by the subject of irregularity, which is actually so important for you to understand that it deserves its own separate section. <clears throat> section 7. Concerning Irregular Figures Since the start of this book, I have been assuming that my readers in Spaceland were already aware of something that I take for granted. I should have made sure to explain to you the most basic, fundamental law of our society upon which everything else is built. Every human being in Flatland is a regular figure, which means that a woman is not simply a line, she is also a straight line. An isosceles workman or soldier must have two of his sides equal, being an isosceles, he is of course defined by his third by side being irregular. A tradesman must have his three sides equal. Lawyers, the group which I, your humble narrator and guide, am part of, must have four equal sides, and in the higher polygon classes, all must sides be, generally, equal. The, sides of, the size of these sides, the size of these equal sides, of course, depends on how old this person is. A female at birth is about an inch long, around 2.5 centimeters, and a tall adult woman may be more than 12 inches, around 30 and a half centimeters long. As for the males of every class as adults, the length of all of their sides, when added together, measures somewhere around 2 feet, give or take, around 61 centimeters. But it is not the length of our sides that is important. I'm talking about the equality of all the sides, and it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to see why the whole of foundation of civ civilization in Flatland rests upon the fundamental fact that nature wills all figures to have their sides equal. If our sides were unequal, our angles might be unequal. Instead of simply being able to judge a single angle by feel or by sight, you'd have to figure out the measurement of every single angle by time-consuming feeling. Life is too short for such mind-numbing groping. The whole science and art of sight recognition would be killed instantly. Feeling, as much as it can be called an art, would soon perish after. Would perish soon after. Casual interaction would become deathly dangerous or outright impossible. No one would ever be able to interact with any stranger or make even the most basic social arrangements without being in danger. In a word, civilization would collapse into barbarism. Am I going too fast for my readers to understand how I've come to these obvious conclusions? 
Surely, if you think about it for a moment and imagine a single instance from our everyday life, you'll be convinced that every part of our society relies on regularity or equality of angles. For example, say you meet two or three tradesmen in the street. You know they are tradesmen by a single glance, a seemingly straight line with a bright point in the center, rapidly growing darker towards either end. You ask them to step into your house for lunch while you discuss business. <clears throat> this is something you can do, right now, without any hesitation, because everyone knows how much space, give or take an inch or two, is taken up by an adult triangle. But imagine if one of these tradesmen dragged behind his regular and respectable triangle, not just a straight line, but a parallelogram of 12 or 13 inches on the diagonal. Now, how are, now what are you supposed to do with a monster like that stuck in your door? <clears throat> Image description start. A simple digital drawing with a black border around it showing a square looking out a doorway at three other shapes. Two are equilateral triangles, and the third is an irregular shape with an equilateral front and a very wide par parallelogram back. Next to the square is a small bar showing three points of brightness with fading edges, lining up with the points of the triangles in front of him as he says, To my view, they all look like equilateral triangles, just at different, different distances from my eye. Then there is another bar behind the three shapes saying, But from another angle, the irregularity is revealed. This bar shows one very large white line with a smaller gray line next to it, matching up with the backs of the shapes above it. Image description end. <clears throat> but I am insulting the intelligence of my readers by explaining things that are clear to anyone who lives in spaceland. Obviously, the measurement of a single angle wouldn't help us interact with an with one another under such circumstances. One's whole life would be hours upon hours of feeling or visually surveying the entire perimeter of everyone you meet. <clears throat> it is already hard enough to avoid running into others in a crowd, even for the trained wisdom of a well-educated square. But if regularity flew out the window and you couldn't assume anyone around you had logical angles, everything would have devolved to chaos and confusion. The smallest panic would cause serious injuries or, if there happened to be any women or soldiers in the crowd, considerable loss of life. This is why expediency teams up with nature in stamping the seal of its approval on regularity of confirmation, and the law, of course, seconds their efforts. To us, Regularity of figure means a combination of both inherent moral failure and purposeful criminality, and is treated accordingly. We do, of course, have some distributors of writing that claim there is no inherent connection be between geometrical and moral irregularity. The irregular, they say, is, from the moment he's born, rejected by his parents, bullied by his brothers and sisters, neglected by his nurses, scorned and suspected by society, and excluded from all forms of trust, responsibility, and fulfilling jobs. His every movement is openly surveilled by the police until he comes of age and presents himself for inspection. Then he is either destroyed if he is found to be irregular past the set margin of deviation, or imprisoned in a government facility as a desk worker of the seventh class. Barred from marriage, forced to serve at a tedious job for practically no pay, and with no other choice but to live and eat entirely at the same office, unable even to take a vacation except without a guard escorting him like the prisoner he is, then, it is any, then is it any wonder that human nature, no matter how pure or benevolent it started out when he was born, becomes bitter and corrupted with a lifetime of this kind of treatment? None of this very plausible reasoning has convinced me, nor has it convinced the wisest of our statement, that our ancestors made a mistake when they set down the law that mandated irregularity as incompatible with the safety of the state. I have no doubt that the life in, of an irregular is hard, but the best interests of the rest of the I have no doubt that the life of an irregular is hard, but the best interests of the rest of society requires that it be hard. If a man with a triangular front and polygonal back were allowed to exist, and to father even more irregular children and grandchildren, what would become of the arts of life? Are the houses and doors and churches all supposed to be changed to accommodate such monsters? <clears throat> Are the ticket sellers supposed to measure every man's perimeter before they let him into a theater, or to take his place in a lecture hall? Is an irregular supposed to be exempt from military service? And if not... How was he going to be stopped from killing his comrades by accident? And just think of the horrible crimes and lies these creatures will be tempted to commit. 
it'd be so easy for him to enter a shop with his, with his polygonal front forward and order whatever he likes on promise of future payment from a too trusting salesman. Let the falsely claimed philanthropists beg all they like for the abolishment of the irregular penal laws. They won't convince me, because I, for one, have never known an irregular who wasn't what nature clearly intended him to be. A hypocrite, a misanthrope, and as far as he can succeed, a perpetrator of all kinds of crime and nuisance. Not that I would, at the moment, recommend the extreme measures adopted by some countries where any infant whose angle deviates by half a degree from the expected angularity is promptly destroyed at birth. Some of our best men, men of real genius, suffered in their early childhood devi deviations as great as, or even greater than, 45 minutes. The loss of their precious lives would have been an irreparable injury to the state. <clears throat> We have also achieved many victories in the art of healing, allowing most irregularities to either part partly or we have also achieved many victories in the art of healing, allowing most irregularities to be either partly or entirely cured through the use of medical compressions, extensions, fusions, and more. I would say there is no point at which we should look at a newborn and decide it is incurably irregular, but if the irregularities cannot be cured before the body begins to form its permanent shape and the medical board has declared that nothing can be done to salvage it, then I would suggest that the irregular child be mercifully euthanized. <clears throat> Section 8 of the Ancient Practice of Painting if my readers have been paying attention to the story so far, you may have realized that life in Flatland can be a little boring. Obviously, I'm not saying there aren't wars, scandals, upheavals, and drama that are supposed to make history interesting, or that we don't enjoy our lives, as strange as they may seem to you in Spaceland. There is something indescribably invigorating about the need for constant calculating of angles, and the usually instant gratification of knowing you've done so correctly. I mean from the aesthetic, artistic point of view that Flatland is, quite literally, dull. It would be difficult for it not to be when all of our lives, ideas, hopes, dreams, even our artistic masterpieces of all kinds, are nothing but a straight line, with no variation at all except for differences of brightness and shadow. It wasn't always like this. <clears throat> If our tradition can be trusted, then we know that long ago, color allowed our ancestors to live in a splendor we can barely imagine. Long ago, in the remotest ages of history, it is said that a pentagon, whose name we do not know for sure, accidentally invented some simple colors and a method of painting. It is said that he immediately began decorating his house. Then he painted his slaves, then his father, his sons, his grandsons, and finally, himself. The beauty and convenience of the results were admired by everyone. This pentagon's most commonly accepted name among historians is Chromatistes, and wherever he went, turning his colorful frame, he was the center of attention and respect. No one needed to, <clears throat> no one needed to take the time to feel him anymore, and no one confused his front from his back. Every move he made was easily read by those nearby without any effort on their part or the need for a calculation. No one bumped into him or failed to move out of his way. He did not have to waste his breath exclaiming his rank, as we colorless squares and pentagons have to today, to get a crowd of ignorant isosceles to show, all, to show us all due respect. The fashion spread like wildfire. Before the week was over, every square and triangle in the district had copied his example, and only a few of the more conservative pentagons refused to join in. After the first month or two, even the twelve-sided dodecagons had fallen into the trend. In less than a single year, the habit had spread to all classes in the district, except the highest of the nobility. Needless to say, it didn't take long for this trend to make its way out of Chromatistes' neighborhood and into the surrounding regions. Within two generations, there was no one left colorless except the women and the priests. With, this, with these two classes, nature house... <clears throat> With these two classes, nature herself seemed to plant herself as a barrier to stop this infection from spreading further. For the innovators, as they were called, having multiple sides was almost a requirement for having color. They would say, distinction of sides is intended by nature to imply distinction of colors. These words were popular, flying from neighbor to neighbor, and helped to convert whole towns at a time to the new cultural wave. 
but it seemed that this idea could not be applied to priests and women. What? 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 I clicked and scroll way too far. Okay. But it seemed that this idea could not be applied to priests and women. <clears throat> women, being straight lines, have only one side and thus, in all their ways that matter, have no sides. Women hated to admit this and were ashamed of it. On the other hand, circles, if we are to accept that they are true circles and not just very high-ranking polygons with many small sides, love to brag and boast that they also had no signs sides and were instead being blessed with <clears throat> and were instead being blessed with a perimeter of a single line or in other words a circumference i can help you see why these two classes could not be convinced by the so-called universal truth of distinction of sides implying distinction of color when it could not apparently be applied to them even after everyone else succumbed to the temptation of self-coloration of self-decoration, the priests and women alone were still pure and unpolluted by the touch of paint. Immoral, vulgar, anarchical, unscientific, there were many names used to describe the ancient days of the color revolt, but, from an aesthetic point of view, these days were the glorious birth of art in Flatland, a childhood that, unfortunately, was cut short before it could mature to adulthood or even enjoy its youth. To live them was to live in a world of del endless delight, because living meant seeing, and even the smallest group of friends was a delight to the eyes, and the richly varied colors in a church or theater are said to have, many times, been so distractingly beautiful that the actors and preachers forgot they had a job to do. But the most beautiful sight was said to have been the unspeakable magnificence of a per military performance. Imagine it. To see 20,000 black-painted isosceles bases suddenly spin to reveal the orange and purple of their two sides at their acute point. The equilateral triangles tricolored in red, white, and blue. The square artillerymen rapidly rotate, rotating to show mauve, ultramarine, gamboge, and burnt umber with their vermilion guns. <clears throat> Image description start. Three shapes on a gray background, each with their sides in different colors, with rows of matching color boxes below them. The first is an isosceles triangle, with sides of orange and purple, and a base of black. The second is an equilateral triangle, with sides of red, white, and blue. The third is a square, with sides of purple, ultramarine blue, amber, and burnt red. Next to the square is a smaller bar of red-orange. Image description end. The dashing and flashing of the five-colored pentagons and six-colored hexagons racing across fields with their doctors, geometricians, and chiefs of staff. With this, display, with this fabulous display of color at military parades, it's easy to believe the famous story of a powerful circle king who found the sight of so, who found the art. Who found the sight of his army so beautiful that he immediately threw away his royal crown and ceremonial baton and declared that from that day forward he was never going to pick up another tool besides the artist's paintbrush. The vocabulary alone that they used to express themselves shows how amazingly colorful the times they lived in were. Even the most mundane statements made by the poorest citizens during the color revolt may s seem to be infused with a richness and creativity that is lacking today. All of our finest poetry, and even the, bit, the little bit of rhythm and rhyme that can still be found in our scientific statements of today, we owe to the amazing era of the color revolt. Okay, I'm going to stop for now so I can take a break. So the next video will be starting at section 9 of the Universal Color Bill. So bye-bye. Section 9. Of the universal, I think I have the microphone on. Okay. Section 9 of the Universal Color Bill. But while the beauty of color was thriving, the intellectual arts were quickly dying out. No one needed to use sight recognition anymore, so they stopped practicing it altogether. Soon, the studies of geometry, statistics, kinetics, and other similar subjects became considered pointless as well, and became looked down upon, even at our greatest university. Not even, whoops. Not even the inferior art of feeling was immune, and 
Not even the inferior art of feeling was immune and stopped being taught at our ele elementary schools. Then the isosceles classes, pointing to the fact... I'm scrolling too far. Then the isosceles classes, pointing to the fact that the specimens were no longer needed for teaching, refused to pay up the members from the criminal class that were owed to the schools, and as a result their numbers, and their disrespect towards the more noble classes, increased by the day now that they were no longer subject to the custom that had both thinned their excessive numbers and removed the most dangerous of them from society. Year by year, the soldiers and workers began to insist more and more often, and with increasing truth to their claim, that there was no real difference between them and the highest-ranking polygons, now that they could deal with all the problems of life just as easily as the nobility by simply using color recognition. And they weren't happy to just let sight recognition naturally die either. They began to actively cause its death by demanding the right to learn it themselves, calling for the law to ban the monopolization of aristocratic arts, and thus banned the exclusive scholarships that allowed the higher non-criminal classes to study sight recognition, mathematics, and even feeling. It wasn't long before they began insisting that color, which was a second nature, had now destroyed the need for aristocratic distinctions at all, and so this meant that the law should follow the same path and legally recognize all classes as absolutely equal and entitled to equal rights. When it became clear that the higher when it became clear that the higher orders were undecided and wavering in their convictions, the revolution pushed even harder, demanding, at last, that all classes, including the priests and women, should honor color by allowing themselves to be painted. When it was argued that priests and women had no sides, so they couldn't be painted, the revolutionists re retorted that nature and expediency had worked together to make the solution to this problem simple that the front half of every human being, containing his eye and mouth, should be easy to tell apart from his back half. They created a bill by which they showed in front of it. They created a bill which they showed in front of an extraordinary meeting of all the countries of Flatland, proposing that all women should have the front of her half. Oh yeah, I was zoomed in before, wasn't I? Hold on. They created a bill which they showed in front of an extraordinary meeting of all countries of Flatland, proposing that all women should have the front half of her painted red and her back half painted green. The priests were to be painted the same way, red on, red on the half of their body where their mouth and eye were, and green for the rest. You can see how devilishly clever this proposal was, and trust me, this plan was not be created by any isosceles. We all know they're too degraded to understand, let alone think of, such an amazing political move. No, the creator of this plan was an irregular circle who escaped being destroyed in his childhood due to foolish sentimentality and was now repaying that kindness by bringing down destruction upon his country and on his countless followers. The fr <coughs> I don't know, I just swallowed some dust. <coughs> The first goal of this ingenious plan was to win over the women of all classes into joining the side into joining with the side of chromatic innovation. Because by painting women with the same two colors as priests, the revolutionaries guaranteed that it would be easy to mistake a woman standing in a certain pose as a priest and treat it accordingly. Hold on, there might just be some noises. The cat's got the microphone covered in cat fur. Sorry for me picking off the cat very loud. <clears throat> this could not fail to appease the mass this could not fail to appeal to the masses of the female sex. But I understand that some of my readers might not understand how a woman and a priest could be confused, even under the new legislation, so let me to explain it to you first. It's very easy to follow. Imagine that a woman, a straight line, is decorated according to this new code, her front half, or head, painted red, and her back end painted green. Imagine you are looking at her from the side, as we would see her in Flatland. Obviously, you will see a straight line, half red, half green. Now imagine a priest, a diagram of which will be provided below. His mouth is at M, and his front semicircle is colored red, and his hind semicircle green. <clears throat> If 
image description start. A diagram showing a circle that is half berry red and half seafoam green, with an eye looking at it from the side. The top of the circle is marked M, the further side from the eye is marked A, and the side facing the eye is marked B. Gray dotted lines show the direct and peripheral, peripheral lines of the sight for the eye, with a bar drawn to show how the eye sees the circle in only two dimensions, as a straight line forming a gradient from red, purple, and green in the center, then growing darker towards the edges. The top of the bar is labeled C, and the bottom is labeled D. Image description end. <clears throat> As demonstrated in the diagram above, if you looked at this great man from the side, you will see a straight line that is half red and half green. The line you see may be shorter than a fully grown woman would be, and might grow darker at the edges faster than a woman's edges would, but the colors alone would be doing most of the work in identifying this person's class to you, allowing you to be lazy and ignore those details, making it easy to confuse a priest with a woman if you are not paying strict attention. Below is another diagram to illustrate the similar similarities. <clears throat> Image description start. An illustration showing a painted line and circle both from a spaceland and flatland perspective, with an eye looking at the shapes from either side. The line and circle are both painted half seafoam green, half berry red. The Spaceland view shows their actual shape, while the Flatland view shows only bars of color, brighter in the center and darker at the edges. The bar representing the straight line is almost identical to the circle, except that the straight line appears longer and the edges do not get dark as quickly as the circles do. Image description end. <clears throat> Now, don't forget what I have already told you, that sight recognition was dying out as an art at the time of the color revolt. It's also important to understand that it was guaranteed that women would figure out how to bend themselves so that their edges would grow dimmer faster, allowing them to imitate the circles even more closely. With these facts in mind, it should be obvious to you, my dear reader, how easy the color bill would make it to confuse a priest with a young woman. It's easy to see why this proposal was so attractive to the frail sex, they looked forward to the chaos that would ensue. At home, they might be able to learn political and priestly sec secrets that were meant for their husbands or brothers, or even give orders in the name of a circle. Outside, the striking combination of red and green, without any other identifying colors, would be sure to confuse commoners into ma making constant mistakes of who is who, and the woman would always benefit from what the circles lost. And this isn't even mentioning the scandals that would be sure to happen to the circular class if the mindless behavior of the women were attributed to them. It's clear that the female sex couldn't be expected to understand the consequences their actions would bring. Even in the households of the circles, the women were all in favor of the universal color bill. The second goal of this bill was to slowly drag down the circles themselves. Amongst the general intellectual decay, they alone still practiced the higher arts kept safely secluded in their childhood growing up in their colorless circular households, the highest of nobles were the only ones who still know how to use the sacred art of sight recognition with all of the advantages and higher education that came with it. Up until the introduction of the Universal Color Bill, the circles had not only maintained their position, but even gained more distance in the gap between their education educational levels and those of the lower classes, all by virtue of refusing to give in to the popular fashion. <clears throat> this is how the clever irregular I told you about earlier, the real author of this diabolical bill, planned, with a single strike, to deal a death blow to the intelligence of the higher classes by forcing them not only to submit to the pollution of color, but to make it impossible for them to receive formal training in the art of sight recognition and destroy their chances of learning even further by not even allowing them to live in their pure and colorless homes anymore. Once polluted by the chromatic taint, every parent and child circle would begin to weaken each other's skill and sight. Once polluted by the chromatic taint, every parent and child circle would begin to weaken each other's skills in sight recognition. The only challenge young circles would have to exercise their minds would be the problem of telling apart their mother, their father and mother, but it's all too likely that the mother would corrupt even this test of skills by her deceptions, which would shake the poor child's faith in the existence of logic and truth itself. Thus, slowly but surely, the intellectual powers 
of the priestly order would fall and leave the road open for the complete and total destruction of all aristocratic legislature and the annihilation of our privileged classes <clears throat> section 10 of the suppression of the chromatic sedition The agitation for the Universal Color Bill continued for three years, and up until the very last minute, it seemed as though anarchy were going to triumph. A whole army of polygons who came together to fight as private soldiers was utterly annihilated by a larger force of isosceles triangles. The squares and pentagons, meanwhile, remained neutral. But, worst of all, some of our best circles fell prey to domestic fury. Infuriated by their political differences, many wives in noble homes tirelessly nagged their lords to give up their opposition to the color bill, and some wives, when they realized their efforts were in vain, became enraged and slaughtered their innocent children and their husband alike, and died themselves in carrying out the crime. <clears throat> Our history book records that our history books record that during this three-year agitation, no less than 23 circles were murdered in their own homes. The threat was very real. It seemed as though the only options left to the priests were submission or extermination. But suddenly the course of events was completely changed by one of those perfect events that statesmen should always take advantage of, try to anticipate, and sometimes even create themselves, because they hold so much power over the sympathies of the people. The story varies a little, but goes generally like this. An isosceles of a low type, with a brain hardly, if at all, above four degrees, robbed an equal lateral tradesman's shop, stealing several paints. In some version of the story, he painted himself. In others, he caused himself to be painted, in some unexplained way. But no matter what version of the story it is, the end result is the same. He is now painted in the twelve colors of a dodecagon. <clears throat> Going to the marketplace, he used a false voice to greet the orphan daughter of a noble polygon who he had been in love with for a long time. With his disguise in place and with the help of both a long string of perfectly convenient accidents and an absolutely absurd level of neglect on the part of the girl's family to prevent just such things from happening, he succeeded in marrying her and they consummated their marriage on their wedding night. When the girl realized the fraud she had fallen victim to, she committed suicide. When the news of this catastrophe spread from country to country, the minds of the women were violently agitated. Sympathy for the miserable victim, and fear that similar deceptions might happen to themselves, their sisters, and their daughters, made them all see the color bill in an entirely new light. Many immediately declared themselves enemies of the bill, and the rest only needed a slight nudge to do the same. <clears throat> Seizing this golden opportunity, the circles hastily called together an extraordinary assembly of countries, and, along with the regular guard of convicts, they made sure that a large number of reactionary women would be there. <clears throat> In this unheard-of crowd, the chief circle of those days, whose name was Pantacyclus, rose to speak, and found himself being hissed and booed at by a hundred and twenty thousand isosceles. But he silenced them all by declaring that, from that moment forward, the circles would begin a new policy of concession, give in to the wishes of the majority, and accept the bill, and accept the color bill. The angry roar immediately changed into applause, and Pantacyclus invited Chromatistes, the Pentagon who was the original inventor of color and leader of the sedition, to make his way to the center of the room to receive the surrender of the circularchy. <clears throat> And then Pantocyclus began a speech, a, master point, a masterpiece of talking points which took nearly the entire day to complete, and cannot be summarized in any way that would do it justice. With a grave appearance of neutrality, he declared that, because the circles were finally committing themselves to the reform, they wanted to take the time to examine the subject in its entirety, its flaws as well as its advantages. Slowly, they introduced the idea of the dangers this bill could pose to the equilateral tradesmen, and silencing the... <clears throat> and silence the upright and silence the rising objections of the isosceles by reminding that by reminding them that despite these flaws in their bill the circles would still accept it as long it was as long as it was the wish of the majority but he came but it became clear that with this part of the speech he had managed to bring everyone but the isosceles to be either neutral or actively against the bill 
and then he turned to the workmen, the highest-ranking isosceles, and inserted that their interests would, should be taken into consideration as well, and if they really wanted to accept the color bill, they should only do so with full awareness of the consequences. Many of them, he said, were on the point of being accepted into the class of regular triangles. Others could expect this honor for their children, even if they couldn't receive it themselves. Hold on, a cat stepping on. Okay, as long as you don't squish the bags. You're adorable. If the color bill passed, this honor they were so close to achieving would have to be sacrificed. With the universal adoption of color, distinctions between classes would no longer exist. Regularity would be confused with irregularity, and the social progression they had worked for generations to achieve would begin to slap, slip backwards, and within a few generations the work, workmen would be degraded to the level of the military, or even the criminal class altogether. Political power would fall into the hands of those with the greatest numbers, which be, would be the criminals, if the regular compet <clears throat> if the regular compensative laws of nature were violated by enacting the color bill. A murmur of agreement ran through the ranks of the workmen, and Chromatistes, in alarm, tried to step forward and speak to them. But he found himself surrounded by guards of the criminal class, and was forced to remain silent while the chief circle, with a few passionate words, made his last appeal, this time to the women, exclaiming that, if the color bill passed, no marriage would be safe, no woman's honor secure. Fraud, deception, and trickery would invade every household, and their domestic bliss would go the same way as the rest of the society, and become a living hell. Sooner than this, he cried, come death! This was the signal that had been planned in advance, and at the sound of these words, the criminal surrounding... The criminals surrounding him transfixed Chromatistes, while the equilaterals parted their ranks, making way for a band of reactionary women who, by the order of the circles, moved backwards, making them almost invisible to the isosceles soldiers they were going to murder. The workmen, automatically following the example of their betters, also moved to let the women through without thinking. At each exit, more bands of criminals formed an impenetrable ph phalanx. <clears throat> The battle, which was more like a massacre, did not last very long. Under the skillful guidance of the circles, almost every woman's first attack resulted in the death of her target, and many of the women were even able to extract their stingers unharmed, ready for a second round of slaughter. But there was no need for a second assault. The rabble of the surviving isosceles did the job for them. Surprised, leaderless, attacked by invisible foes, and with all escape routes cut off by the criminals, they immediately, predictably, lost all pretense of intelligence, and began to shout, TRAITORS! This sealed their fate. Every isosceles now saw every other one as a deadly enemy. Within half an hour, all of them were dead, and the fragments of over 140,000 criminals proved that, order had been, proved that order had triumphed over chaos. Cat, you're good. That's the sound of a cat being extra throw with the litter box and just clawing at the side for no reason at all. Might not actually show up on the microphone. Are you done yet? Oh my gosh. The circles wasted no time in pushing their victory all the way through. The workmen were decimated, every tenth man transfixed without mercy or hesitation. The militia of the elite... The militia of the equilaterals was called forward, and every triangle reasonably suspected of irregularity was immediately destroyed by court-martial, without waiting for any measurements to be taken by the social board. The homes of the soldiers and workmen were subject to a series of inspections that could continue for more than a year, and during this time, every town, village, and hamlet was purged of all of the degenerate criminals who had been allowed to multiply unchecked, thanks by thanks to the refusal to pay tribute to the schools and university, and because of all of the other laws of, of the Constitution of Flatland that had been violated since the creation of color. This is how the natural balance of the classes was once again restored. <clears throat> 
Needless to say that any use of color for painting was outlawed, and even owning it became illegal. Even just using any words to describe colors, except by circles or sanctioned scientific teachers, was punished severely. There are rumors that, in the very highest and most specialized university classes, color is still sometimes used to illustrate some of the most complex problems of higher mathematics, but I have never had the privilege of attending any of these classes, so this is only rumor. Aside from these rumors, color, color is non-existent in Flatland now. The art of making it is known only to one living person at a time, the chief circle, and that knowledge is passed down to his to his successor only upon his deathbed. Only one factory in all of Flatland still produces color, and to prevent the secrets of its creation from getting out, the teams of workmen are executed each year, and a fresh team of workers brought in to, complete, to continue production, so great is the terror of it, to this day, our aristocracy still feels when looking back to the long-ago days of the Universal Color Bill. <clears throat> Section 11. Concerning Our Priests it's high time that I move on from these explanations of the things of Flatland and get to the main events of this book, which is my introduction to the mysteries of space. That is my subject. Everything that has come before now is simply the preface. This is why I cannot take the time to explain to you all of the things I assume you are extremely interested in, if I may flatter myself. For example, I will not be going into detail about how we move around despite our lack of feet, or how we construct our buildings of wood, stone, or brick and plate. <clears throat> or how we construct our buildings of wood, stone, and brick in place despite our lack of hands and our inability to lay foundation as, foundations as you and Spaceland do, and the fact that we cannot use gravity the way you can. I also can't take the time to explain to you how exactly the rain begins in the spaces between our various zones so that the northern areas don't stop moisture from falling to the south. I do not have the time to tell you about the nature of our hills and mines, our trees and vegetables, or our alphabet and method of writing which has been adapted to fit our linear tablets or books. These and a hundred other details of our lives I must skip past, and the only reason I mention them at all now is to make it clear to my readers that I have not forgotten that these things exist. It's just that I don't want to waste your valuable time explaining them all. But before I can really move on to the true subject of this book, I have no doubt my readers will be demanding some final knowledge about the pillars that uphold the constitution of Flatland, the controllers of our conduct and the shapers of our destiny, the, object of, the objects of universal respect and even worship. Do I need to specify that I mean our circles or priests? When I call them priests, I want to make sure you understand that the word for us means more than you would define it. To us, Priests are administrators of all business, art, and science. They are the directors of trade, commerce, generalship, architecture, engineering, education, statesmanship, legislature, morality, theology, and many more. They do no work themselves, but ensure that all work that is done is worth doing. Although the common idea is that everyone who is called a circle is a circle, the better educated classes know that no circle is really a circle, he is just a polygon with a very large with a very small number of sides. Wait now, hold on. He is just a polygon with a very large number of very small sides. As the number of his sides increases, a polygon begins to approximate a circle, and when the number of sides becomes high enough, say for example, three or four thousand, bleh, say for example, three or four hundred, then it becomes extremely difficult for even the most delicate touch to feel any polygonal angles, and they are declared a circle. Well, I should say that it would be it would be difficult because, as I have said earlier, recognition by feeling is unheard of in the highest classes of society, and to attempt to feel a circle would be considered the most outrageous of insults. Refusing to allow himself to be felt enables a circle to easily maintain the veil of mystery which he wraps himself in from his earliest childhood, preventing others from knowing the exact measure of his perimeter or circumference. But we can still do our own calculations. With three feet being the average perimeter for an adult, the math shows that, in a polygon of 300 sides, each side will be less than, less than a hundredth of a foot, or just barely a tenth of an inch. <clears throat> in a polygon of six or seven hundred sides, the sides are hardly larger than the diameter of a head on one of your pins. For the sake of courtesy, it is always assumed that the current chief circle has 10,000 sides. 
The rise in social status of male children of the circles is not restricted by the same law of nature that limits the lower classes to an increase of one side per generation. If it were, the number of sides in a circle would be simply a question of family pedigree and basic math. We would easily know that the 497th descendant of an equilateral triangle would be a polygon with 500 sides, but this is not the case. Nature's law lays down two new and opposing laws that apply to the male children of circles. 1. As the number of sides of a circular father increase, his son's number of sides will increase drastically. 2. As the number of sides quickly increases, the ability to produce male children decreases just as quickly. In the home of a polygon of four or five hundred sides, it is rare to find a son, and that child will never have any brothers. But at the same time, that single son may be born with fifty or even a hundred more sides than his father has. Art also steps in alongside nature to help this process of higher evolution. Our highest doctors have discovered that the small and still tender sides of a newborn polygon of the higher classes can be fractured and his whole frame rebuilt with such scale that a polygon born with two or three hundred sides can sometimes, but not always because the surgery comes with serious risk, can sometimes leap ahead by what would have taken two or three hundred generations and, all at once, double the status of himself and his own future sons. Many promising infants have been sacrificed in this way. Hardly one out of ten survives, but the parental ambition is so strong among these polygons who live on the fringe of the circular class that it is very rare to find a nobleman who has not placed his firstborn son into the circular neotherapeutic gymnasium before he has reached the age of one month. One year's treatment determines success or failure. By that time, the child has, in all probability, added one more tombstone to the fields that crowd the neotherapeutic cemetery. But, on rare occasions, a joyful parade escorts the little one back to his exalted parents, no longer a polygon, but a circle. At least as much as anyone can be a circle. It only takes a single positive result to convince untold numbers of polygonal parents to perform their own domestic sacrifices, which almost always end, not in the rare circular child, but in the much more commonly fresh, but in the much more common freshly marked gravestone. Section 12 of the Doctrine of Our Priests The teachings of the circles can be summed up in a simple statement. Attend to your configuration. Whether political, religious, or moral, every lesson the circles teach us has the goal of improving the configuration or physical shape of individuals and society at large, with special, with special importance placed on the configuration of circles, which is the most important goal of all. The circles are to be praised for how well they've suppressed the ancient lies that convinced men to waste their time and energy laboring under the false belief that someone's behavior was shaped through free will, effort, training, encouragement, praise, or anything else except configuration. It was Pantacyclus, the hero mentioned before now as the one who ended the color revolt, who first convinced mankind that configuration is what makes the man. That if, for example, you were born an isosceles with two irregular sides, it's guaranteed you would go down the wrong path in life unless you got them evened out. This would require a visit to the isosceles hospital, or if you were an equilateral triangle or square, or even a polygon, if you were born with any irregularity, you must be brought to one of the regular hospitals to be cured. Otherwise, you would inev inevitably die in the state prison or by the sharp angle of the state executioner. Pantocyclus declared that every social problem, from the smallest misbehaviors to the most outrageously violent crimes, was caused by physical irregularity of the body, which could be caused by anything from bunk bumping into someone in a crowd, not exercising enough, or exercising too much, or even just a sudden change of temperature. This illustrious philosopher concluded from this idea that good behavior deserves no praise, and bad behavior deserves no blame. Why should you praise, for example, the worth of ethic of a square lawyer who works hard to defend his clients when you should instead be admiring the perfect precision of his right angles? Why should you blame a lying, thieving isosceles when instead you should be hating the incurable irregularity of his sides? In theory, this doctrine is unquestionable, but in practice it has some drawbacks. <clears throat> When dealing with an isosceles, if the lowlife argues that he can't stop himself from stealing because of his irregularity, the judge likewise has no choice but to sentence him to death because nothing can fix the behavior of the isosceles and the case is closed. 
But when dealing with your own misbehaving children, when the penalty of death is out of the question, configuration theory can make parenting very awkward. Several times I've found myself backed into a metaphorical corner when one of my hexagonal grandsons, who is misbehaving, blames his refusal to do what he's told on a sudden change of temperature that was just too much for his young perimeter. He argues that instead of blaming him for something he can't control, I should be helping him strengthen his configuration, which, he argues, would be helped along by giving him all of his favorite treats. When this happens, I can't argue with him without violating the ruling of the circles, but I also can't just give in to his demands without question. Personally, I've decided to assume that a good scolding and timeout has a positive and strengthening effect on my grandson's configuration, though I do have to admit I don't have any physical proof of this. But I'm not the only one who uses this loophole to avoid violating the doctrine. I've seen many of even the highest circles when they are judges in law courts, placing praise and blame on regular and irregular figures. And in their homes, I've seen firsthand how, when scolding their own children, they speak of right and wrong just as passionately as if they believed these words represented real things that a human figure could choose between. <clears throat> By constantly enforcing their policy of making configuration the ultimate goal in every mind, the circles have reversed the rules that you Spacelanders apply to your own family relationships. Your children are taught to honor your parents, but with us, the circles... <clears throat> but with us, after the circles, a man is taught to honor first his grandson, if he has one, or his son if he doesn't. But let me make it clear that by honor I do not mean indulge or spoil, but to make them the best they can be. The circles teach us that the duty of fathers is to always give advantages to their offspring before themselves, which helps increase the status of not only their direct descendants, but the whole state as well. The weak point is that in the system of the circles, if a humble square may be so bold, seems to me to be in how they conduct their relationships with women. <clears throat> because reducing the number of irregular births is such a top priority for the good of society, it is logical to conclude that a woman who has any irregularity in her ancestry should be considered an unfit partner for anyone who wants his sons to have an increased social mobility through an increase of regular sides. Now, Irregularity in males is a simple matter of measurement, but because all women are straight, and as far as the eye can see, regular, one has to figure out another method to measure what I call their invisible or potential irregularities that might be passed down onto their offspring. <clears throat> the state has taken care of this by recording carefully kept pedigrees showing the family history of all those registered. Without a certified pedigree, a woman is not allowed to marry. Now you might assume that a circle, proud of his ancestry and ambitious for descendants, one of whom might even become the chief circle someday, would be more careful than any other man to make sure he chooses the wife who will produce the best sons for him with no stain of irregularity in her history. But you would be wrong. The care taken to choose a purebred regular wife seems to grow lazier as one rises higher in the social scale. Nothing could ever convince an inspiring Asasiles, who hopes to produce an equal lateral trunk, son, to take a wife who has ever had a single irregular member registered in her family tree. But a square or pentagon, who is confident that his family is on the fast track to higher status, won't even bother asking any further back than the 500th generation. A hexagon or decagon is even more careless with his potential wife's pedigree. And a circle has been known to purposefully marry a woman whose great-grandfather was irregular, all because of the attractive quality of her reflected light, or because of the charm of her deeper voice, something we flatlanders find, maybe even more than you, an excellent thing in a woman. As you might expect, these badly judged marriages result in either no offspring at all, or offspring who are blatantly irregular, or who have re outright reduced in the number of, of sides. But none of these disastrous results have ever stopped anyone. The loss of a few sides in a highly developed polygon is easy to dismiss, and is sometimes compensated for by one of those miraculously successful operations from the neotherapeutic gymnasium, which I described earlier. And the circles are much too willing to submit to infertility as a natural law of the superior development to do anything to fix it. But if this evil is not stopped and so far 
the so far slow destruction of the circular class could accelerate, and the day might come, sooner than anyone expects, when our race will no longer be able to produce a chief circle, and flatland as we know it will be destroyed. I'm aware of another danger that should be warned against, though with this one I have no easy solutions to offer, and this one is also on the subject of our relationships with women. About 300 years ago, the chief circle decided that, because women are lacking in reason but have an overabundance of emotion, they would no longer be treated as rational and would no longer receive any education. The consequence of this declaration was that women were no longer taught to read or write and weren't even taught enough basic arithmetic to count the number of sides on their husbands or sons. It was inevitable that each following generation would lack more and more intellectual power, and this rule of female non-education still continues to this day. My fear is that, though made with the best intentions, this policy goes too far and harms us of the male sex. Because with things the way they are now, we males have to lead an exhausting bilingual and, please don't think I am exaggerating, by mental existence. With women, we speak of love, duty, right, wrong, pity, hope, and other completely irrational, emotional concepts which do not actually exist. We pretend these things are real for the sole purpose of controlling feminine outbursts. But among ourselves and in our books, we have an entirely different vocabulary, and I might almost say language. Love becomes the anticipation of benefits, duty becomes necess necessity, or fitness, and so on and so forth. More importantly, when we are among women, we use language that implies absolute worship for their sex, and they fully believe that the chief circle himself is less important to us than they are. But behind their backs, they are both thought of and spoken of, by all except the very young, as little better than, to quote, mindless organisms. The matters of religion are also spoken of completely differently when we are in the women's chambers than when we are outside. My humble fear is that this double training in both language as well as thought places too much of a burden upon the young males, especially when they reach their third year, when they are the first remove, when they are first removed from the care of their mothers. They must entirely unlearn their first way of thinking to make way for the new language of science, but then they still have to speak in the old language when in the presence of their mothers and nurses and sisters. Already, I think that children today struggle more to understand basic mathematics than our ancestors did 300 years ago. Not to mention the danger that would arise if a woman ever manages to learn how to read and tells the rest of her sex what she's found in just a single popular book, or the possibility that a very young male might reveal to his mother the secrets of the logical language, either by accident or purposeful disobedience. Based on the simple fact that the current policies make men less intelligent, I humbly ask that the highest authorities rethink the laws forbidding female education. Part 2. Other Worlds Oh, brave new worlds that have such people in them. Section 13. How I Had a Vision of Lineland It was the day before the last day of the year... 1999, and the first day of the holiday vacation. Having stayed up late, amusing myself with my favorite geometry problems, I went to my bed with an unsolved math problem in my mind. That night, I had a dream. I saw in front of me a huge number of small straight lines, which I naturally assumed to be women, along with some other beings that were smaller and, and appeared to me as glowing points. They were all moving from side to side in, as far as I could see, a single huge straight line, all moving at the same speed. Image description start. A black and white digital illustration titled, My View of Lineland. The diagram shows a square labeled, Myself, with an eye on a lower corner labeled, My Eye, looking down at a row of lines and dots. In the center of the row is a line slightly longer than the others, labeled the king, with eyes on either side. On either side of the king are a few more lines labeled men, followed by a shorter line labeled a boy, and several dots labeled women. Below this text, in parentheses, reading, the king's eyes much larger than the reality, showing that his majesty could see nothing but a point. Image description end. As they moved, they made a continuous, jumbled chirping or twittering noise, but sometimes they stopped moving, and when they held still, there was silence. 
approaching the largest of what i thought were women i said woman what is the purpose of this area why are you all making these chirping noises and moving back and forth in a straight line but she didn't react i repeated myself a second time and a third but still got no response finally losing pace Patience with what I thought was extreme rudeness, I shoved forward and brought my mouth directly in front of her, to stop her from moving forward again, and loudly repeated my question for a fourth time. Woman, what is the purpose of this area? Why are you all making these chirping noises and moving back and forth in a straight line? I am no woman, replied the small lion. I am the monarch of the world. But you, where have you come from to intrude into my world of lineland? Surprised by this sudden answer, I apologized if I'd startled or annoyed his royal highness, but explaining that I was a foreigner, I asked the king to give me some information about his world. But I had a very hard time getting any information from him that actually interested me, because the monarch kept assuming that whatever was obvious to him had to be obvious to me, and decided that I was just pretending not to understand as a joke. However, by persevering in my questioning, I got the following facts. It turned out that this poor, ignorant monarch, as he called himself, was under the impression that the straight line that he called his kingdom, where he spent his entire life, was the only was the only thing not only in his world, but the entire universe. Unable to move or to see, except for what was inside his straight line, he had no idea that anything existed outside of it. He had heard me the first few times I'd spoken to him, but the sound of my voice had been so unnatural and confusing that he'd made no answer. As he explained, he'd seen no one, and my voice had seemed to come from inside him, as though from his own intestines. What I called his side, he called his insides, and to him, my voice had been nothing but a confused jumble of sounds beating against his stomach. Until I had placed my mouth in his world, he'd been unable to understand me or see me, and he still had no idea where I'd come from. Pause while I get a drink. Outside his world, or line, everything was blank to him. But no, because even the word blank implies space. It simply didn't exist. His subjects, with the lines being men and the points being women, were all just as trapped in that singular plane of motion and vision in that single straight line, which was their whole world. The only thing they could ever see was a point. Man, woman, child, object, all were nothing but points to the eye of a linelander. Only the sound of the person's voice could tell you their sex or age. And because each individual took up the entirety of the narrow path of their universe, this meant that no one could move to the side, and no one could move past anyone else. Once neighbors, always neighbors. Neighborhood for them was like marriage for us. Neighbors stayed neighbors until death came to part them. Such a life, with nothing to see but a point, and motion only possible in a straight line, seemed to be unspeakable seemed to me to be unspeakably miserable, and I was surprised at how cheerful and full the life of the king was. Wondering how it could be possible for these line laiters to reproduce when their circumstances seemed so hostile to the possibility, I hesitated for a long time to question his royal highness on such a private subject, but at last I had get <clears throat> but at last I had to give in to my curiosity, and casually asked about the health of his family. My wives and children, he replied, are happy are healthy and happy. I was staggered by this answer because, as I said before, the only people anywhere near the king were men. I dared to reply, Pardon me, but I don't understand how your royal highness can see, let alone approach their majesties, when there are at least half a dozen people between you, which you can't look or go past. Do you mean to tell me that in Lineland, touching isn't needed for marriage or for the creation of children? "'What kind of absurd question is that?' demanded the monarch. "'If touching were required, the universe would soon run out of people. "'No, no. Neighborhood is not needed for the union of hearts, "'and the birth of children is too important to be left up to the random chance of proximity. "'You have to know this. "'But since you think it's funny to pretend you don't, "'I will explain it to you like you are the most uneducated child in Lineland. "'Listen well. Marriages are made by the senses of sound and hearing.' You are, of course, aware that every man has two mouths, voices, and eyes, a deeper, ba a deeper bass on one side and a higher tenor on the other. 
I wouldn't bother to mention this, except that I haven't been able to hear your tenor voice while we've been speaking. I had told him that I only had one voice, and that I hadn't been aware that his royal highness spoke with two. That confirms my theory, said the king, that you are not a man, but a female monstrosity with a deep voice, and an utterly uneducated ear for music. But let us continue. Nature herself has declared that every man should, wear, should marry two wives, and— Why two? I interrupted. You're taking this joke too far, he cried. How else can there be a harmonious union without the combination of the four in one, the bass and the tenor of the man, and the soprano and the contralto of the two women? But what if, I said, a man wanted to only have, w to have only one wife, or three? That is impossible, he said. It is as inconceivable as saying two plus one equals five, or that the human eye could see a straight line. I would have interrupted him again, but he continued, saying, In the middle of each week, a, na a, law of <laughs> a law of nature compels us to move forward and backward with a rhythm faster than normal, which lasts a hundred and one seconds. In the middle of this dance, at the fifty-first moment, the inhabitants of the universe suddenly stop in place, and each individual sings out his fullest, his richest, fullest, most beautiful song. It is in this moment that all of our marriages are made. So powerful is the evolution of ba bass to treble and tenor to contralto that the loved ones, even if they are twenty thousand leagues apart, can still in instantly recognize the voice of their destined lover, and, cutting through the pathetic obstacle of distance, love unites the three. <clears throat> the marriage is consummated in that moment, and results in the birth of three children who take their place in Lineland. What? Always three? I asked. Does one wife always have to have twins, then? You base mo voice monstrosity, yes, replied the king. How else could the numbers of the sexes stay balanced if two girls weren't bored for every boy? Do you want to defy the very laws of nature? He stopped talking, speechless, speechless with fury. It took a while before I could convince him to continue his explanations. Do not assume, of course, that every bachelor finds his mates as the first try in this universal ma marriage song. On the contrary, it's normal for the ritual to be performed many times before it is successful. If you are lucky enough to instantly recognize the voices of the partners destined to them by providence and complete the harmonious embrace. For most of us, it takes a long time to, su to successfully marry. The man's voice might perfectly match up with one of his future wives, but not the other, or sometimes not with either at first. In cases like this, nature declares that every weekly chorus will bring the lovers closer into harmony. Each test of their voices allows them to discover where they are going wrong and gives them the opportunity to change accordingly. And after many tests and adjustments, eventually the marriage is achieved. There comes, at last, the day when the three distant lovers suddenly find themselves in exact harmony, and before they even realizing it, the, married, the married triplet is celebrating. <clears throat> the married triplet is being celebrated by nature as one more marriage and three more births. Okay, uh, we're gonna stop here for now, and then I will continue in a third video. So, bye bye.